All right, you're ready to go. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, today's meeting of the Ag Conservation and Forestry Committee. Um, to get started out this morning, we're going to start out with um, introductions of committee members, and I'm going to start with uh, Representative Landry. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative O'Neill. I'm Scott Landry. I represent District 113, the towns of Farmington, New Sharon, here in rainy Franklin County. Thank you. I'll go next to Senator Buck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Russ Black from Wilton, representing Senate District 17, which is all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec, Belgrade, Mount Vernon, Vianna, and Fayette. Thanks. I'll go to uh, Representative Schoolfield. Good morning, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. My name is Tom Schofield. I represent House District 112 in the snowy town of Weldon, Franklin County. We're snowing here. Hasn't turned to rain. Hopefully it won't. I represent 17 towns and townships in Franklin and Somerset County. Thank you. Thanks. Um, go to Representative Booker. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Bill Fluker. I represent House District 95, which is in Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. Um, Senator Maxman. Hi, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, which is all of Lincoln County, except for Dresden, plus Washington and Windsor. Thanks. Uh, Representative Underwood. Good morning. I'm uh, Representative Underwood from Prescott. It's a little on the rainy start. It rained a little bit up here, but great place to be. Thank you. Thanks. And Representative Osher. I am Laurie Osher. I represent District 123. That's the majority of Orno, the home of the University of Maine. Thank you. Um, and my name is Maggie O'Neill. I represent House District 15, which is in Saco. Um, I'm going to go over what our agenda is for the day, and then we'll turn to our first item. So from 11 to noon, we have scheduled a briefing from the Wild Blueberry Commission. Um, it's a follow-up on something that was initiated in government oversight. Um, and then beginning at noon, we're going to have a joint meeting with the EUT committee to talk about um, farms and siting solar. And then beginning at 1 p.m., we're going to have work sessions on a number of bills, including um, LD-174, which is um, to implement recommendations to end hunger of that advisory group, LD-493, um, which had to do with a report about custom slaughterhouses, um, LD-736, um, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system, and LD-1929, which is an act to provide assistance to areas severely infested with brown-tailed moths. Um, so first, I want to, um, if Karen's here, just have uh, to start out the meeting with the Wild Blueberry Commission. If Karen could give the committee some context on um, why it is we're having this meeting and, and what this report back is. Good morning. Um, it is still morning, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Government Oversight Committee um, last year, I think this initially started with the Washington County delegation asking the Government Oversight Committee um, to include, um, I don't know if audit is the right word, but um, basically include the Wild Blueberry Commission in the scope of their work of um, making, uh, looking more uh, closely at that organization. So um, the Government Oversight Committee wanted input from the ACF Committee. And so we held a briefing last spring with the Wild Blueberry Commission and we were asked to report back to the, the Government Oversight Committee. And I think uh, essentially the gist of um, ACF's response to uh, GOC was, you know, there have been a lot of changes within the Well Blueberry Commission. Um, there's a new executive director. And so the ACF committee last year wanted to give Wild Blueberry Commission more time to land on its feet and give them a chance to um, make some changes that people feel were needed and see um, you know, what could happen in the last 
uh, approximately a year. So this is kind of um, an update. We're asking Eric uh, Venturini, the executive director of Wild Blueberry Commission to kind of talk about what has happened in the last year or so. And then um, I guess, you know, you can all decide how you want to, um, you know, provide feedback to the Government Oversight Committee. Thanks, Karen, for that intro. And um, and a couple of things I just want to add because I happen to serve on both committees. So, um, so it was a couple of years ago now that we um, got that request from folks in in Washington County to um, to initiate an investigation and. Um, GOC committee is kind of off to the side, so not a lot of people know about what it does or how it works, but there are kind of two categories of things that we do. One is um, we is, you know, kind of routine. We'll go through a review of, of all tax expenditures, and those will include things like pine tree development zones and, um, and historical tax credits and, and things like that. And we just have a regular schedule that we're going through to review and provide input on whether those are working well. And the second is um, that legislators or, or, um, or committee members can initiate um, a request that OPEGA review something. And what happened is people came and requested a review on the Wild Blueberry Commission and, um, and how those tax dollars were being used and, um, and different things like that. So that's why we responded with, um, we had a, a work list that was pretty full and it can take years to get on that list. Um, and some of the things we were looking at at the time were the deaths in the child welfare system and, and whether folks had um, adequate representation with the indigent legal services and billing issues and things like that. Um, so because I could remember that this was an urgent issue that, um, that folks had come to talk about us in a prior session, I wanted to make sure we addressed it. So we brought it to the um, to the ACF committee to use our kind of oversight function to have a committee conversation to see if there was anything we could do to help. Um, so in that context, we had Eric do a briefing and, and requested some information and um, wanted to do a check-in um, this year for an update. So that's that's where we are. and. Um, and I just wanted to share that making a, a request with OPEGA um, is, um, it just indicates to me that this is something that, um, that the committee can keep eyes on. Um, it, it would be like getting a, someone made a comparison of making a call to the police and then someone rescinding that call. And, and we just want to make sure that, um, that our attention is, is on the subject and we're, um, working with folks to address their concerns. So um, if we could bring up um, Director Venturini for his, um, for his update, he has already sent the packet out as well, I think. We should have that in our email if you wanna look at the written version too. He's been really good at communicating and, and sending that stuff over, which I appreciate. Good morning, Director Venturini. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Representative O'Neill. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to see you all again. So I think what I want to do is um, I just we jump have in? until noon. Yeah, if you could if you could go through the materials and then we can take committee questions on it. I'm sorry. It's a, I think I lost my internet for a minute. Um, so I'm I'm going to hand it off to you, and and if you could go through the materials that you had sent out, and then we can um, do some committee questions. Perfect, Our time perfect. frame is through noon today. Great. Um, so let me just share my screen here. Okay, so can you all see the first slide of this presentation? Yes, we can. Thanks, Eric. Perfect. Thank you, Representative. Um, so good morning, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and esteemed members of the Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Eric Venturini. I'm the Executive Director of the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine. Um, thank you for setting aside your valuable time for this update. 
Um, you all received last week two documents in preparation for this briefing. One is a letter that outlines major changes in both the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine, that I'll refer to as the Commission, and the Wild Blueberry Association of North America, US, which I'll refer to as Wabana, US. The second is our annual report, um, which is the first time the Commission has ever issued an annual report intended for an, for an audience of Wild Blueberry industry members. Um, and I'll also remind um, you, you, you mentioned the, the briefing in April 13th of last year. During that briefing, um, I was asked to provide additional information to address several questions. And to satisfy that request, I compiled the information to address them and sent that to you all and to the Washington County delegation on April 29th of last year. Um, so I'm gonna start today with a high level schematic um, that was part of the materials I sent on the 29th, because I think it does a good job providing a basic understanding of our funding and typical allocation structure. After that, I'll go through the major commission and Wabana US um, updates as described in the letter. And then finally, I'll provide an overview that follows our annual report, which I think neatly summarizes commission work and investments in 2021. And I'll try to do it all fairly uh, succinctly. So, um, so this uh, is a schematic that shows um, where the tax comes from um, and, how, and how that tax is typically used. This, again, I put together last year. So this is the budget from last year. It's not actual expenses and it doesn't reflect the budget from this year, but I think it shows, uh, it provides a good idea of how the funds are used. So to start off at the top in purple, we have growers and processors that are required by statute, each to um, pay three quarters of a cent per pound on wild blueberries uh, produced in Maine. Um, in addition, unprocessed raw wild blueberries that come in from Canada are often processed in Maine um, to a lesser extent, and, and those berries are taxed at the full amount of 1.5 cents. So that full volume of production is taxed in total, 1.5 cents per pound grown or processed in Maine, uh, which led to, so that tax is on the 2020 crop in this example, which was a short crop uh, because of significant statewide drought, which led to um, our tax allocation for the 2021 budget year of $809,393. Of that, the commission voted um, in a public meeting um, to, um, uh, to allocate 540,000 to support Wabana US. And the breakdown of how that was budgeted out within Wabana US is here below. Um, if there are questions, I can go into it further, but for the sake of time, uh, the rest of that tax allocation um, is used for commission operations, which are here on the right. Um, so for example, $100,000 or so on the top um, to support, um, to go down to the Big E Agricultural Fair in Massachusetts um, to promote wild blueberries, um, some funding for a grant to increase web-based market connectivity of Maine wild blueberries. Um, and that's a, a match for, for a grant from the state. Um, and again, I won't go through all this in detail, but I think that uh, the annual report will, will get at a lot of this as well. So unless there's questions, um, I'll move on. Thank Please, you. We can. Do Sorry. I see any questions from committee members? Or I see a hand up from Representative Osher. It's a lovely figure, but the way we're looking at it, uh, it's hard to see anything um, except that it's lovely. So if you could <laughs> describe, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that the flow chart goes down and then there's, I see that there's seven boxes there with some numbers. Mm -hmm. and I can see some numbers are bigger than others, but if you could, I would appreciate if you gave us a little more detail about what is in those boxes. And then Absolutely. The, at the, the, on the right, you told us what was in the top two boxes. That was mm -hmm. great. I would love to hear more about what's in them because I haven't looked at the report. Um, so it's okay. Good. Yep, I will, I will go through it. Um, and then also, uh, you, you should have it all in materials, not from what was sent this time, but what was sent on uh, April 29th last year. So uh, within the Wabana's, Wabana's budget for last year, on the left, I'll start at the left here, um, Wabana US allocated $60,000 to foreign market development. Um, and actually a lot of that is income um, through, uh, through 
um, uh, through a grant from um, from what's called the MAP program, MAP, um, to support foreign market development, uh, which is, is called the Market Access Program. Uh, we didn't actually use all of that because uh, COVID shut down so many events uh, in foreign markets. So a lot of that went unspent last year. Um, here, the next box, we have almost $200,000, which was allocated to health research, um, which funded both health research projects, you know, grants to fund research on the health benefits of wild blueberries, and also um, to hire a consultant who's an expert, you know, nutritionist and, and, um, and helps us to, you know, coordinate our strategy um, and, uh, and coordinate with those researchers. And then we spent almost three hundred thousand dollars on uh, we uh, Wabana US spent almost three hundred thousand dollars on marketing uh, promotion, uh, which includes social media influencers, influencers, public relations, um, content development for um, for the website, and also for all the different social media platforms, um, and uh, and so on. So you know, this is the promotional budget. Um, and then $14,500 um, annual audit costs, as well as other legal fees, for example, um, you know, trademark uh, certification costs, those kinds of things. Uh, a little over $6,000 for meetings, uh, mailings, communications, um, $3,400 for uh, insurance and you know, miscellaneous expenses, uh, administrative expenses, and then $95,000. So Wabana, U.S. does not have an executive director. They do not have staff. They hire the commission um, to the tune of $95,000 to provide administrative support for, to, to oversee and, and, uh, and coordinate Wabana U.S.'s um, programs. And so that's what this 95,000 is. So that goes back to the commission. This here, uh, so this line is the commission's um, you know, budget for, uh, for, for 2021. I should say this is all, ex, um, you know, expense-based. This is an, an overview. It does not provide, you know, the income lines, um, but that the full budget was provided in the materials that went out on, um, on uh, April 29th as well. Thank you, so Eric. I mentioned I the top, to the Big E Agricultural to... Fair, the match for the state grant. Eric. So the third one down is the school nutrition program. Um, which I'll talk about more in detail uh, later in the presentation. Um, Eric, I just wanted to pause for, for a moment um, yes. to let people know that Karen has just forwarded the email from you um, so that if folks want to open up their email, they can get this attachment and then zoom in more. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Can people give me a thumbs up if they could hear? Okay. All right. So it's in your email if you want to take a look. All right. Thanks, Eric. And I had I had one more question too about the growers and, and processors. Could um so could somebody technically be paying both taxes if they're growing and processing? We lose him. Zoom's an adventure. He froze. Uh, right, internet was... problems. I think, there I think I'm back. So, oh, not to worry. So I, I heard you say, Representative O'Neill, uh, to pause, but I didn't catch uh, anything else after that. Oh, sure. Oh, I was just letting people know that they could find that document on email because Karen um, forwarded that to people. And I had a question for you about um, about the grower versus processor. Um, so technically, some people could be paying both because they could fall under both categories. Um, so, so the by statute, the tax is uh, you know if you grow a pack of blueberries in Maine, you know that is taxed at 0.75 cents per pound. If you process a pound, whether that's the same pound you grew or somebody else's product uh, that they then sold to you for processing, uh, that's another 0.75 cents a pound. So yes, um, 
a company that grows and processes um, a pound of wild blueberries is charged the full 1.5 cent tax. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Yep. So the last thing we heard was going over this um, this bar to the right. Sure. So I was on um, the fourth bar down on the commission's um, budget for 2021, which is $5,500 for printed promotional materials like t-shirts and aprons, which we often supply to state fairs, um, provide um, often at cost for folks to use for their own promotions. And then we have $85,000 a year that gets put into a rollover budget that the advisory committee allocates uh, for University of Maine Wild Blueberry Research and Extension. We committed a total of $50,000 several years ago, um, $10,000 a year to support University of Maine's plant diagnostic laboratory. So that's in our budget for another few years. We had a $60,000 discretionary account um, uh, in 2021, largely because we may have needed to hire uh, legal representation to represent us for um, a U.S. trade representative safeguard investigation on all blueberries uh, in the U.S., cultivated, wild, frozen, and fresh. We did not end, end up having to hire that legal representation, so much of that went unspent. Um, $15,000 um, is uh, events and partnerships. So we, for example, support the Maine Wild Blueberry Queen. Uh, we you know, provide some funding to various state fairs for certain wild blueberry events. Um, and so that all comes out of this budget. We uh, allocate 19,000 a year for state and federal policy consultants to provide expertise um, to help us advocate for the industry. Uh, we spent 47, allocated by budget, 47,450 for Wild Blueberry Weekend last year. Um, we are a member of many, um, a, a number of national federal policy coalitions, which have membership fees. And we had in our budget last year, $13,130 for that. And then under kind of standard commission operations, which includes um, the annual audit, insurance costs, mailings, um, and other operational expenses, $38,400. And then um, salaries, health benefits, payroll costs for myself and two staff. Uh, last year, the budget was a total of $266,915. So that's, um, that's, that's everything there. So any other questions there or should I move on? Thank you. No problem. So I'm gonna go through uh, several major either organizational or functional changes in the commission that I believe are uh, relevant to the concerns raised by the Washington County delegation. Um, first, since July of 2021, uh, so this is not a permanent change, but it may be important context. Uh, the commission has been functioning with a board that is comprised of five growers and four processors. And that's because one of the industry's processors was purchased by another, uh, reducing the number of individuals eligible for our five processor seats by one and leading to his resignation from the commission. The commission dedicated significant time, uh, meeting time in 2021 to develop and to discuss and to refine, uh, refine bylaws. Uh, the commission is of course governed by the Wild Blueberry Tax Statute, that's MRS Title 36, Part 7, Chapter 701. Although that statute allows us to have bylaws to govern our functions, um, to date we had not had any. In January of this year, uh, the commission conditionally approved a bylaws draft, and we're currently seeking legal review to ensure that those bylaws are in alignment with the statute. And the commission will consider final adoption uh, of those bylaws at our next meeting in June. I think most relevant to the concerns laid out by the Washington County delegation, uh, the bylaws will require that the office's leadership of, of the commission chair and vice chair are equally representative between grower representative and processor representative. So that if a grower is chair, then a processor must be vice chair and vice versa. Uh, those bylaws when adopted would also require that the commission inform uh, the main wild blueberry industry of pending vacancies, seats on the commission. What has been done to date uh, and which is spelled out in our governing statute is that the commissioner of ag conservation and forestry has tried with appointing new commissioners 
announces pending vacancies at the Ag Trade Show in January, uh, in January of any year in which a seat will be open. I don't believe that a single announcement is sufficient to encourage and inform industry members of the opportunity, especially considering that the Ag Trade Show has been virtual for the last two years. Um, so per these bylaws, we would supplement that announcement with industry outreach of our own, um, ensuring that we're simply informing the industry of the opportunity and certainly never raising one nominee over another. Much of the concerns okay. laid. Yes. I wanted to, if we could go back to that previous slide about the updates, who can serve as a grower and who can serve as a processor? Are there any limitations on size for either? Can we go over? I think uh, we made some changes in 20 or, you know, whenever 2019, maybe. Yeah, there were changes in 2019. Um, a processor, a grower, uh, excuse me, a processor representative is uh, an entity that uh, processes over a million pounds of wild blueberries. Um, that's, that's what I have from memory. I don't have uh, the statute in front of me to read the rest of it. Um, I will say that because of the, um, because we now have one less, um, you know, eligible, um, you know, entity in the state to fill that empty seat, the commission will be discussing the statute at our June meeting. Um, and I have no doubt that, um, you know, some of these different definitions will be discussed by the commission and voted on at that meeting. Thanks. So there's a, there's a limitation on size for the processors, but there's no parallel one on the growers for the definition. I don't, I don't believe so, but I'm, I don't have it in front of me. Okay. Um, and I'll write this down. Um, so you don't have to worry about jotting it down, but could you come back to the committee with the current number of processors that, um, that are above that threshold of a million pounds per year? And then um, also the number of processor, processors that are under that million pounds per year who are paying the tax? I'm thinking that um, whether you have it or, or MRS could, could support that request. I can tell you right now, that um, there are five processors in the state that currently process over a million pounds a year. Typically that varies year to year what they actually process, uh, but there's five, there were six, um, you know, this time last year. And in 2021, uh, thus far though, I'm working with MRS um, on some of the uh, details in, in, in their report to me, but. So far, we have 23 payees of the uh, of the tax, um, which indicates that there would be 18 folks who paid the tax um, that you know are are not um, that that produce less than a million pounds a year. Whether or not they can be considered processors, um, you know, I'd have to look at the companies. I know, for example, um, you know, some wine companies, for example, are on there because. You know they process the berries in there. Um, you know as they create the wine, so it's not cut and dried. But uh, but I do have those numbers handy. So yeah, that would be helpful if you could talk about um, the number of processors under a million pounds, and then um, and then give the kinds of details that you're offering here. You know, some of it might be wines, it might be different kinds of things, just to give us an idea of of who, you know who they are, what they do, how many are out there. And something that was um, that was raised and was part of the um, was part of the request for the investigation was um, consolidation. So um, something that I would like to request too is if you can come back with um, a his, you know a little bit of a report on the history of of consolidation within the processing sector over the past twenty five years or so. We'll see what I can do. Thank you. Would you, are you thinking there would be an additional briefing or should I provide this as written material like I did last year? Um, providing it as written would be great. And then I think the committee can discuss what we wanna do, but written sounds like a great step. Okay. 
All right, and I see a hand up from Representative Blue. Thank you, Madam Chair, and <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Venturini, for being here today and doing all this work and putting the report together. Um, uh, I was a little confused on one point. Is the million dollar, or the, sorry, the million pound processor rule, is that in statute or is that rule? Is that something would require legislative action or could the commission address that in its June meeting? It's in statute. It's in statute, okay. Um, and then you also had mentioned the the bylaws are drafted. Would you mind including that in your written materials when you send it to us? Uh, yeah, it's a draft, uh, you know, up for approval in June, um, but I oh, can okay. I can provide what I have. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so much of the concerns laid out by the delegation, the Washington County delegation, focused on the funding that the commission allocates annually to the Wild Blueberry Association of North America US. Um, in any given year, up to two thirds of the industry, industry tax are invested in Wabana US um, as determined you know, by a vote of the commissioners in a public meeting to support promotion and marketing while Blueberry Health Research and international market development. Um, in January of this year, the commission requested that staff develop a memo of understanding regarding the commission's funding allocation to Wabana, Wabana US. And this MOU is called the Wild Blueberry Promotion, Marketing, and Health Research Agreement and sets out objectives that the Commission asks Wabana US to achieve, key performance indicators uh, to measure progress, and a plan for Wabana US to update the Commission on progress made towards achieving those objectives. This MOU defines clear expectations and report back to the Commission and ensures that both organizations are on the same page regarding expected outcomes from the Commission's investment. Perhaps this slide doesn't belong in organizational updates, but one of the most important components, and I think a big part of um, the reason why there was originally a request from the delegation is uh, you know, communication, um, increasing communication, and hopefully um, you know, increasing also trust and transparency within the industry. And the commission has over the course of the last year continued to make great strides. And I believe we've significantly increased and improved the quality and quantity of and access to information about the commission's activities. Um, as I mentioned, we released the first ever annual report, um, which has already been shared via our constant contact email, which is now going for two years an emailed newsletter. Um, starting in March of 2021, we started to develop the first website to provide information um, about the commission and that website was approved by the commission in January and is now live. Um, the background here is the first page of that website. Um, and then finally this year, we will carry out a series of grower listening sessions as part of our two year strategic planning cycle. Input solicited from those sessions will be provided to the commission this fall and incorporated into our two year shared priorities and plan of work for 2023. Um, in summary on these uh, industry, industry communications, uh, Courtney Hammond, a well-known wild blueberry producer whose family has been in the business for generations, uh, said during the public comment period at our January commission meeting, and I quote him with permission, it's great to see what the industry has accomplished in a year. We're headed in a better direction. Now, while the commission has been making changes, so has the Wild Blueberry Association of North America, U.S. Eric, could we pause before this slide? I see a hand up from Representative um, Landry. Uh, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, Eric, uh, listening to all the numbers and, and the issues, it seems that I remember part of one of the complaints that I heard way back was that we weren't promoting main blueberries, we're promoting wild blueberries. I understand that, you know, you've got an international flavor to this whole business here, but am I... Am I off base in recalling that? Wasn't that part of the issue? Uh, it absolutely was brought up, and um, and I'm going to touch on that in a few a few more slides. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, um, so 
So while the commission has been making changes, so has Wabana US. Um, and first, Wabana US amended its bylaws in December of 2021. Previously, the board of Wabana US required that there was one more processor serving on the board than growers, so that if there were five processors, there would be four growers. Um, this is a the bylaws now require that an equal number of growers and processors sit on the board, and now there are four growers and four processors. So this is a permanent structural change in the organization of Wabana US. And then finally, last but definitely not least, Representative Landry, um, Wabana US has approved a major promotional campaign, the likes of which have been requested by many in the industry for years. And that is launching this year to focus on the main attributes of our berries. Most of Wabana US promotion in the past has focused on health research, and many industry members have expressed concern that there was not enough focus on the main brand. This campaign is a significant investment and in undertaking, and this direction is a milestone, and the industry is quite excited about it, as am I. For example, one of the growers that attended our January plan of work and budget setting meeting said during a discussion about 2022 funding for Obama US's promotional program, and I quote Brian Powers, again, with permission, I understand that there's a level of mistrust that has festered in the blueberry industry that's occurred over a long period of time. We need to deal with from this point on and stop revisiting the mistakes of the past. I think we've got a good organization. I think they've proved analytically, empirically, and monetarily that they're doing a really good job. And we're embarking on a radical change here and to throw a wrench in it is ill-considered at the least. And the radical change he's referring to is this main um, uh, promotional campaign. So the next thing that I'll do is um, go through the annual report that I sent to you. Um, and so unless there's any questions on these kind of structural changes within Wabani US and the commission, I'll, I'll move on to that. Thanks, Eric. I have a I do have a question about um, so Representative Pluker had requested those um, those improved bylaws that you're talking about that make the shift um, five processors to five growers and um, it's my understanding that um, those were when did that draft come out or when was that draft finalized. You're talking about Wabana US bylaws? Yeah, I guess I'll complete my thought. Not, I'm not speaking about Wabana. I'm, I'm talking about the commission. You were you were saying that um, that something was shifted to make it um, equal five and five. Oh, oh, I'm okay. That's now I'm following. You're talking about something else because there was something about um, the chair and and vice chair to be opposite grower processor. And so, um, and we'd requested those bylaws, but I'm wondering if you can also share um, about who is in those positions now and whether it reflects the new bylaws that are adopted or whether it's going to shift to, to reflect that. Uh, yep, the current chair is, um, is David Bell. He's a processor representative and the current vice chair is Simeon Allen and he is a processor representative. And uh, in June, when the bylaws um, are, um, you know, considered for approval. Um, you know, we will have to address that so that we are in uh, keeping with the bylaws that we adopt. Okay, so when they're adopted in June, there will be an opportunity to make that change because it's my understanding that recently there was a vote um, to to put these people back in, even though there's just a couple months left, and we knew that that change was in place already. Yeah, that's right. So every year uh, the commission votes, uh, elects officers and uh, David Bell and Timmy Allen were, were reelected. They served also last year. Um, and, you know, in June when we, um, um, you know, when the commission votes to adopt bylaws, we will have to clearly address um, address that or, you know, we would be in violation of, of bylaws, which are legally binding. So, um, yep, that'll happen in our June meeting. Okay. And would you be able to send um, a record of, of those votes cast at the um, January commission meeting and for the chair and the vice chair positions and how, um, and how that shook out? 
And I'd also um, like to have a copy of the Wabana bylaws that you uh, mentioned too for us to review. Yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. Great, thanks. Do I see any other questions? All right, seeing none. Welcome, Representative. I mean, Senator Moore. Good to see you. Thank um, you. So, oh, sorry. No, I just was going to say thank you for uh, allowing me to, to attend. I just want to thank Eric for your presentation. I think there's been a lot of work done this past year. I know I've had conversations with Courtney, and it seems that that they are pleased with the way the route that we're taking. So I, I thank you for that, and I thank this committee for continuing to follow up on. I think it's very important. It's a it's a huge industry in Washington County, and that's why the delegation was so interested in making sure it all got taken care of correctly. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Moore. Moore. So I'm looking at the time, and we have 15 minutes left. So, um, so using that time, Eric, could you go over the remaining remaining items, and then um, leave a little bit of time in case the delegation wants to add anything toward the end, too, and any questions? Absolutely. So I will. Um, I'll just hit on a couple of. Um, you know, a couple of major activities that the commission conducted in 2021, just to give an overview, kind of a flavor of what we do in a given year. Um, a little less than maybe I had uh, planned for, but but I think it'll it'll cover the important parts just fine. So if you'll bear with me, I'll share this. And I'm going to refer to the annual report. I'm going to put that on the screen. Again, you should all have that. Um, So what I'm gonna start with is right here, industry communications. Um, you know, I hit on some of this. Uh, I think we've done a lot uh, to improve industry communications. I encourage you all to check out our website. I mentioned the grower listening sessions, this annual report, um, and this provides some metrics from our, um, our constant contact email campaigns. We've seen 30% growth in industry sub subscribers over the year and a 44% um, open rate, which is 19% uh, higher than the industry average, which indicates that folks are actually engaging in the content that we send. <clears throat> Skip over this, because we've already talked about it a bit. Um, our advisory committee, uh, which is tasked per the Wad Blueberry Tax Statute, is to advise and work with the University of Maine system to develop and approve a plan of work and budgets for research and extension programs related to the production and use of wild blueberries. In 2021, they awarded $126,000 to support University of Maine research and extension on wild blueberries. That figure supported 10 research and funding requests from five researchers. And those researchers using either that grant funding and, uh, and or the advisory committee's published industry research priorities leveraged an additional $781,000 in funding to research and provide wild blueberry producer education to the industry. 29% of that advisory committee allocation in 2021 went to research and help address climate change challenges and helped to leverage an additional $152,000 of external funding on wild blueberries and climate change, which is an alignment direct alignment with the commission's 2021 strategic priorities. A few key projects last year that the commission uh, funded through the advisory committee was a study by Dr. Lily Calderwood to investigate ways to use cool bots um, cost-effectively to cool wild blueberries post-harvest. Another for Dr. John Zhang to study the effects of biochar as an amendment to possibly improve wild blueberry drought resistance. And two projects that supported Dr. Annis's research on understanding um, fungal pathogens or plant diseases to inform wild blueberry management decisions. One of our biggest single investments of staff time in 2021 was the launch of the first ever Maine Wild Blueberry Weekend. 14 farms participated, 60 restaurants, bars, and other establishments participated, and we estimate that 6,000 people visited farms during the weekend. We invested $47,957 to launch Wild Blueberry Weekend through our Fresh Pack and Value Added Committee. And um, through earned media, as well as social media, 
um, and other and other avenues, we reached 3.5 million people. So 3.5 million impressions. Um, uh, sorry, Governor Mills herself played a major role in making this event a success when she announced a formal proclamation declaring that weekend in August to be Wild the Bray weekend. In short, the event, event was a major success, both in creating opportunities for small participating producers and also telling the Maine Wild Blue Bray story on what was a national stage to help grow loyalty to the Maine Wild Blue Bray band, uh, brand. In this commission report, I have included um, uh, some you know, overview information of uh, the outcomes of the investment in Wabana as well. Uh, which is, of course, our largest investment in any given year um, and funds promotion, marketing, and health research. Um, I worked with Wabana US to actu accurately capture the impacts of their programs over the year. Uh, health research investments in 2021 led to 10 Wild Blue Bray health studies that are either recently completed in progress or recently awarded, while our promotional investment is no longer matched by Wabana Canada our health research investment is allowing us to have an outsized impact on health research with limited funds. On the promotional side, our investment in Wabana US drove 24,000 visits a month to Wabana US's website, wildblueberries.com, uh, started to establish wild blueberries as a brain health food, published a healthy eating guide called the Cognition Kitchen, which has been very successful. Um, and ongoing promotional content on Wabana US's social media platforms, website, and, and other outreach platforms. Looking at the numbers, our promotional work seems to be effective. Uh, market share of wild blueberries in the frozen fruit market grew 7.9% over the last five years, while our major competitor, the cultivated industry, lost 7.9% of their market share. Wild blueberry frozen retail sales are up 9.8% in 2021 over 2020, compared to cultivated whose retail frozen sales grew only 0.3%. Total wild frozen retail sales are up 78% over the last five years. And most importantly, consumer demand for retail frozen wild blueberries has increased 19.6% year over year. Relatively speaking, our school nutrition program here is a minor investment that helps convert the next generation to the taste of wild blueberries. And to do that, we promote Maine wild blueberries to schools across the country, who then request them through the USDA commodity buy programs. In 2021, our $62,000 investment helped to generate over $3.8 million in sales of Maine wild blueberries to schools. Um, I will stop there for the sake of time. There is more in the report. Um, if you have any questions, I obviously ask them now or feel free to give me a ring anytime and I'd be happy to chat further. Thank you, Director Venturini. All right, I'm looking to committee members to see if anyone has a question before me. Um, all right, I see no hands. I had a couple requests for you. One was um, in the materials you sent us last year, there were two ways that USDA measured farm numbers because one of the big big concerns was farms being lost. And there was a point at which there was limited data. And I wondered if, um, so my request is whether you can circle back with um, main revenue services or, um, or look at a different avenue to get some better figures for that so that we can have that for our committee records. Uh, I can certainly do that. I can address some of that now as well, if you would like. Okay, I think what I wanna do is um, I'm looking at the time and I wanna make a list and then maybe we'll see see what we have time for. Um, and the second thing um, is if you could um, give some more information about what the, um, I think your terminology was key performance indicators of the marketing. Um, what do you measure? Is it is it clicks? Is it amounts of stuff people buy? And how do we know that that is benefiting main main growers in particular? Because that's something that I've been hearing is people are paying their tax dollars and their concerns about um, who's contributing and and who's benefiting. So um, so I'd like some more information about those performance indicators. Um, 
And I see a hand up from um, Representative Lindy. Uh, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, this question is actually for Senator Moore, if she would. Since she was involved in bringing this whole issue forward, I, I would like to know from her how her constituents are feeling about the progress, about where we're, where we're headed. Thank you for that question, Representative Landry. And I, I have, I'll be honest with you, I've not spoken with a whole lot of them, but I know that when I attended the Blueberry, Wild Blueberry Weekend, everybody was very, very pleased with what they were seeing. It was a very, very good turnout. And overall, I think we had a really good season this year. And my conversations have been, for, uh, as I mentioned with Courtney, and I think that was an important, he was one of my important pre people that I was listening to. And Greg Bridges was another one. And I think we, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very pleased with what's going on and, and knowing that we're going forward to where we need to be. And I see Representative Perry has joined us. She may have another comment as well. Thank you very much. That's just what I wanted to hear. Uh, yeah, I, would, Perry, I wanted to invite you in too. Sorry, we didn't get you in sooner. Oh, that's all right. The, the listening is what really needed to happen. Um, looking at what's happening, it's going to take time to really show the differences. Uh, I have received some angst from some of the smaller growers, but again, History does not turn over on a dime. And um, I'm really pleased to see the progress in the look at getting a better look at the main wild blueberries, uh, a, the changes on the configuration of Wabana. Uh, and also, you know, if we have a chance to get a look at the bylaws uh, that are happening. I, I think that we need time to see how these changes really do affect the, the the stuff that we were working uh, to uh, see uh, happen. And um, I think there's been a lot of work in a very short time and uh, certainly worth continuing to watch. Thank you, uh, Senator Moore and Representative Perry for being here. And I had one more question um, for you, Eric, if you could, um, cause I remember last time, I don't know which briefing it was, you went over certain goals um, that you had identified with, with the group of stakeholders um, that you were working on achieving. And one was stopping the loss of small growers and acreage. And I'm wondering if you can speak to specific action items that, that serve, you know, that's on your plan for this year that serve that goal. Sure. Um, so first off, I, maybe I'll give a couple of quick um, statistics on that, um, you know, to, to that maybe get at what's what's happening already. Um, so I've got some numbers from NAS, that's the Na National Agricultural St Statistics Service, that don't do number of farms every year, but they do have an acreage number. Um, in 2017, the acreage harvested, uh, so first in 2016, the acres harvested was 23 thousand acres, 23,100 acres in Maine. In 2017, that's when the price just dropped out. It was 17,000. 2018, 18,800. 2019, 20,500. And 2020, 20,700. I don't have 2021 figures, but acreage is increasing. The number of farms, the last number I have is 2017 because that only comes out every five years. I have no other data on the number of farms other than the MRS, figures, which is not the number of farms, um, it's the number of pays of the tax. Um, there's most producers sell to a processor and thus are not included in the tax rolls. Um, but I, I can say that, uh, you know, so starting in 2014 and then going year by year, we had 33 payees, then 34, 39, 37, 39, 37. Last, uh, in 2020, we had 28. Last year, 2021, we had 23. And I think what we see there is really a COVID response, the great resignation and all that, and the fact that the average age of wild blueberry producers is 64 and a half. Um, people are retiring and stopping um, the loss of that acreage as people retire, recruiting more people into the industry um, is definitely a priority. Stop the loss of small growers is a published shared priority of the commission um, and something that I think 
really all of our work uh, is geared towards. Uh, for example, um, we have a proposal on the table that I've coordinated with Land for Good on, which would put on farm succession workshops for wild blueberry producers. The commission will consider the merits of that proposal in June and determine at that time whether or not to fund it. We're also working with Maine Farmland Trust. And we pointed out to them the opportunities and needs in this industry around innovation, recruitment, and farm transition. And at MFT uh, decided to um, decided to offer a wild blueberry business planning course, which actually just ended and I've heard very good things about. Uh, we have also con convened, which was part of the annual report, an innovation working group, uh, which has identified two innovation concepts to pursue. Uh, one of those is, um, uh, is aimed at identifying um, the, the, the scale gap. So there's a challenge where small producers it's very challenging to scale up value added products. And so the innovation concept is, well, you know, we need to seek um, ideas and, and innovations and funding to try and create uh, innovations that would, um, you know, maybe help make it easier for small producers to scale up. Um, so this is an on ongoing work. Obviously, we're hoping that in the course of this year that we may be able to secure funding uh, to support that. But I mean, everything, even including, you know, increasing demand through the promotional investment, health research, you know, investment that we make in Wabana. Uh, I mean, all of that, you know, producers, small to large, you know, can sell their product to a willing, uh, willing consumer because consumers are aware of the health benefits and the story of Maine wild blueberries. Thanks for your responses, Eric. I'm, I'm looking at a time check and um, we'll be having the EUT committee joining us starting at noon. So um, we'll have to transition to that. Um, do we have any, just any requests from the committee before we conclude? All right, seeing none, I would just request um, a written version of the, of the action items for small growers. And I, and I appreciate, I have heard um, feedback that there's more work to be done, but that folks are appreciative of the process that you have put in place. So thanks for taking the time with the committee today. And thank thanks to the Washington you. County delegation as well. All right, I um, if Senator Dill's mic is working, I wanna turn over facilitation to Senator Dill for this briefing. Thank you, Representative O'Neill, is it working? Yes. yes. I had to change out my monitor. So something wrong with the uh, speakers and the mic. So, well, um, we'll move right along. Uh, we will go on to our briefing on agricultural land and siting solar arrays. And if you would let in Amanda Beal and Nancy McBrady, please. Also, represent, I mean, Senator Dill, um, the EUT committee that yep. is here are coming in under my name. Okay. So they will need to change their names if they would, please. Yep. So as soon as we get everybody in, we'll start here in a couple of minutes. And... Cheryl, do you know how many uh, folks from EUT are going to be here? I see one I in so not. far. I know two from the ENR are coming. Okay. And But they are, actually, they're probably in the waiting room. Just a second. Uh, they're not there yet. Oops, I see uh, Representative Barry's. Yeah, yeah, he's there. Yeah. Did you bring him over? Nope, I didn't. I didn't either. Oh, there he is. Okay. And I know that um, another a late another lady was going to. But I don't see her there yet. <clears throat> All 
Well, we'll try to keep an eye out on uh, attendees to see if other folks show up from the committees. So with that, we probably uh, ought to get going, but just so everybody's aware with the folks from EUT introduce themselves, I see Representative Foster. Yes, good morning. I'm Steve Foster. Good afternoon now. Uh, represent District 104, which includes Dexter, Garland, Stetson, Exeter, and Charleston. Representative Barry. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us to join you. Uh, my name is Seth Barry. I represent House District 55, Bowden, Bodenham, most of Richmond, and beautiful Swan Island on the Kennebec. And uh, we do have with us our committee analyst, Lindsay Laxon, as well. All right. And from uh, ENR, I believe, uh, Representative Grohowski. Yeah, uh, I'm Representative Nicole Grohowski. I'm from EUT um, and really EUT. glad to be all with right. you all today. <laughs> um, I represent House District 132, the city of Ellsworth, town of Trenton. Thank you. And with that, I think we've uh, introduced everybody. So we will go ahead and uh, start with our presentation on solar arrays. Is that you, Director McBrady, or is it going to be Commissioner? I'm going to get us started and then I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Uh, but first we have to uh, load up the slides here. Just give us a second to get ready. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that all right? Yeah. Okay, let me just adjust my screen a little bit here. Make it easier for me to see. Okay, great. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill and members of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee for having us here today. And also thank you to those from the EUT committee that are able to be with us as well. My name is Amanda Beal, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, and I'm joined by Nancy McBrady, who is our Bureau Director uh, for the Bureau of Agriculture, uh, Food, and Rural Resources. Um, and my notes are freezing, so I'm just going to get rid of them, <laughs> and we'll just see how this goes. Um, so Nancy, if you could please go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so yes, uh, we're very happy to be here today to report on, well, to, to give a presentation on a report that we've submitted previously on LD820, which was a resolve to convene a working group to develop plans to protect Maine's agricultural lands when siting solar arrays. And um, just by way of a refresher, um, the, that resolve in particular required us to convene a working group of stakeholders to develop plans and consider ways to discourage the use of land of higher agricultural value and encourage the use of more marginal agricultural lands when siting a solar array. And to that, I wanted to just say that um, we as a department, even prior to this resolve, uh, have been of course having numerous conversations with stakeholders about this topic and uh, gathering feedback and developing resources, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. Um, so I just wanted to note that this has been a, a, an ongoing conversation, but we were pleased to be able to devote some time to pulling together a stakeholder group. Uh, and one other thing I'll say as we go forward is that in our report back to you, we really intended to reflect upon uh, that, that broad input, as well as to really draw from perspectives that reflect the broad uh, mission and goals of DACF as a whole. And, uh, oh, okay, we're on the slide. Sorry, because my notes are a little scattered now, I'm going to just have to refer to a couple of different pieces of paper here. Um, so one of the things that we really uh, wanna say upfront is that we are very supportive of renewable energy development in Maine. Uh, we do understand that it's really an important uh, goal and strategy that we are implementing around uh, um, addressing climate change. And it's an important part of our climate action plan. And so we are very much in support of that work and 
At the same time, we know that it can really present opportunities for farmers to diversify income, as well as give them opportunity to address their own energy needs, which we all know that energy is quite, uh, you know, it's a key expense for any farm operation. Uh, we also, at the same time, we strongly recommend prioritizing siting of solar projects on non-agricultural lands and within areas that do not contain rare plant populations, provide habitat for rare or exemplary natural communities, or diminish the ability for our natural working lands to effectively sequester carbon. Um, and the one other point I really want to call your attention to on this slide, which is sort of a, a guiding principle for us, which is that we all know that productive agricultural soils are finite resources and they are important to us for many reasons. And so, you know, with all of this in balance, we do think that there are absolutely ways that we can site solar projects and protect our um, important natural resource base and particularly our agricultural soils going forward. Next slide. And so this slide is just to give you a, a little bit more um, uh, to think about in terms of when I mentioned earlier that, you know, DACF, we have a pretty broad goal or broad mission. And so we have, uh, you know, a number of different goals that we are working on all at once within our department. And we wanted this report to be reflective of that. And so, as you know, we're intricately involved in the stewardship, monitoring, and maintenance of accessible public lands, healthy forests, wildlife habitat, and productive agricultural soils. And we know that these soils or these lands support healthy and diverse ecosystems in the state. And they are critical to our natural habitat and economic opportunities that support the foundation of our heritage industries, as well as being important to our tourism and recreation sectors. And uh, we just, you know, at the department, we, we are thinking all the time about how we in our role are both protecting, stewarding, enhancing all of these resources. And at the same time, looking with an eye towards the state's renewable energy goals and thinking about how all of these things can fit together. Next slide. So one of the, one of the overarching um, bodies of work that really was important to us and is important to us each and every day, because as I've said, I know you've heard me say this before in other discussions that, you know, climate change impacts basically everything that we do as a department. Uh, it impacts the, the resources and the lands that we protect and steward. And so climate change has become a very important uh, piece of work for our department and being part of the Climate Action Plan and the Maine Climate Council is also been important to us. So Maine won't wait our climate action plan. It is, uh, of course, it offers strategies aimed at meeting Maine's greenhouse gas emission targets. Uh, and these strategies intersect with a number of different areas, including renewable energy, natural and working lands, and food production. So I'm going to call out a couple of the strategies within the report that um, really illustrate this. So strategy C, uh, reduce carbon emissions in Maine's energy and industrial sectors through clean energy innovation by achieving by 2030 an electricity grid where 80% of Maine's usage comes from renewable generation. And then strategy D talks about growing Maine's clean energy economy and protecting our natural resource industries, such as by increasing the amount of food consumed in Maine from state food producers from 10 to 20% by 2025 and 30% by 2030 through local food system development. Next slide. Strategy E uh, also talks about protecting Maine's environment and working lands and waters, and further notes that by current estimates, Maine loses approximately 10,000 acres of natural and working lands to development each year. This is a figure which is projected to grow in the coming years. We know that the pace of development is not slowing, it is picking up. Uh, avoidance of this potential impact could possibly be achieved by developing policies by 2022 to ensure renewable energy project siting is streamlined and transparent while seeking to minimize impacts on natural and working lands and engaging key stakeholders. 
And another goal set under strategy E is to increase by 2030, the total acreage of conserved lands in the state to 30% through voluntary focused purchases of land and working forest or farm conservation easements. So again, the protection and preservation of these lands is very important to meeting our overall goals. Um, next slide. And then um, one other uh, uh, goal that is reflected in both strategies D and E reflect to our uh, forestry resources. And in the report, it, it, uh, it points out that uh, in, sorry, each year Maine's forests, which cover 89% of the state, sequester an amount of carbon equal to at least 60% of the state's annual carbon emissions, a figure that rises to 75% when durable forest products are included. So this is really central also to our, uh, our climate action plan and our goals as a state. And in strategy E, um, one of the implementation outcomes was for, to um, establish a forest carbon program task force, which the governor did by executive order early last year. And we, I co-chaired that, um, that task force and we finalized our report in October, 2021 that as directed, explored incentives to encourage forest land management practices that increase carbon storage, specifically on woodland owners of 10 to 10,000 acres. And so you can look at that report, there are a number of recommendations there, but just as an overarching principle, I wanted to point out that fundamental to achieving the recommendations in this report and our overarching forest carbon sequestration goals is that we work to maintain our existing forest land base. Next slide. So this slide is just a, well, a couple of caveats I wanna point out ahead of time. Um, these, these numbers are for, from 2020. Um, they are numbers that this represents uh, the number of uh, total acreage reviews of proposed uh, renewable energy projects. And this is not what was actually approved for develop development. And even if approved, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will happen. So this is a very you know, preliminary way of looking at this. But um, what we wanted to show here is just that if you look at the top line in the chart, of the number of requests that were reviewed, um, that's 811 total, 335 pertain to solar development. And if you look down at the next line, it shows that uh, the project request acreage totaled just over 43,400 acres. And about, if you look at the next line down, about a third of those acres um, included or intersected with uh, farmland soils. So we just wanted to, to point that out, we know that farmland soils and agricultural soils are uh, attractive to solar developments because they, the developers, because they tend to be clear, open land, um, relatively flat. So uh, they, they seem to be um, most of the way they're ready to be turned into a solar array if that is, uh, if it's in a location that meets their other needs as well. Um, next slide. And so, you know, recognizing that this opportunity is both a push and a pull for farms, um, there can be, there are concerns out there that uh, solar development on agricultural lands can turn into a, a situation where it creates competition for affordable land or land that farmers rely upon that they might not own, but they lease and they don't necessarily have full control over. And, um, there's also been a number of reports to us at the department about farmers feeling like they've been sort of inundated with a lot of phone calls and mailings, encouraging them to develop their land into uh, solar arrays. And we do know also that some municipalities are passing um, ordinances or, or putting moratoria on solar development, um, just trying to pump the brakes and figure out you know, what kind of policies they need to put in place to make sure that they're retaining all of the different kinds of values that they want while also uh, encouraging and inviting solar development. Um, as I said before, we know it can be helpful for farms in terms of the diversified income stream if they do allow development. And again, we do think that thoughtful siting can allow farming operations to continue while also realizing the benefit of solar development. And next slide. 
Um, this is my last slide. So this is just back around to some of the resources that I mentioned that we have developed. Um, we do not regulate siting of development or agricultural soils. I just wanna make that really clear, but we have tried to create some resources that will help people to make good decisions about siting, um, things to be thinking about if you're a farmer, things to be thinking about if you're a developer. And uh, we have a web page that's devoted to these resources. And specifically, we have um, a, uh, put together this DACF technical guidance for utility scale solar installations and development on agricultural, forested, and natural lands document. And uh, that is uh, very accessible on this website as well. And in addition, Maine Audubon and Maine Farmland Trust have also developed some helpful resources. And so with that, I think the next slide is for Nancy. Go from here. Yes, it is. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy McBrady. I'm the Bureau Director at the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources. And what I will now be speaking to is the Agricultural Solar Siting Stakeholder Group process that uh, was conducted in <clears throat> 2021, excuse me. And as a reminder, uh, LD 820 um, did put forward uh, that this stakeholder process um, was to kick off. Um, and as Commissioner Beal had mentioned, we had already prior to LD 820 been thinking about a stakeholder uh, effort as well. So let me walk you through this. We had eight facilitated meetings between June and December of 2021. Um, this was co-chaired by myself and Selena Cunningham. Um, she's the deputy director of the governor's energy office. She is uh, attending the work session today and is available for any questions, if anyone has any for her. Um, and together we worked with 13 members of uh, the stakeholder committee. Um, they all came from diverse backgrounds and offered different perspectives, whether they were from an ag background uh, or a uh, solar development background and, and everything in between. We, we had a lot of uh, diversity of, of perspectives there, which was very helpful for engaged conversation. At every meeting, we also had public engagement uh, that allowed for public comment. And we also had a comment period for the draft report. Over these facilitated meetings, we dug into a number of topic areas, in particular, having a deep dive into Maine's current solar industry landscape, um, reviewing the state's agricultural uh, industry and its potential, as well as solar development potential in Maine. We looked at other states' solar siting policies, in particular, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Vermont. We had Maine Audubon present on its Maine Renewable Energy Siting Tool. And then we also heard from another uh, a, a other group of stakeholders, including Maine Municipal Association, which presented its perspective on a number of topics, including current use tax law, which I'll talk about in another moment. And Maine Revenue Service also talked about current use tax law. And then Maine DEP uh, spoke to licensing processes for solar development in the state. We heard from a number of solar developers about their experience with uh, solar in Maine, uh, in particular, those projects known as dual use. And dual use is essentially where um, solar rays are installed on a, a, a farm, but farming activities also occur concurrently so that a farm's productivity doesn't necessarily cease due to uh, solar being installed in particular portions of that farm. Uh, we also heard from one farmer uh, who spoke about making the decision to convert 45 acres of his family farm into solar and which allowed for the bulk of the remaining farm acreage to remain in farming, uh, which um, was a, a very powerful thing to hear about. What I'm gonna now go through are the seven recommendations that came out of the Agricultural Solar Stakeholder Group report. Um, that report is attached to our report back to these committees and is also available on the Governor's Energy Office website as well as our own website. The first stakeholder recommendation deals with data. They, the stakeholder group and the department agree that there needs to be a creation of centralized clearinghouse of information. We need a publicly accessible database that contains key characteristics, including spatial data, 
showing those solar projects that are approved and uh, constructed. As of right now, there is not a tool that meets the needs of uh, folks within this arena to really understand what is happening in the state and um, what is on the horizon. This type of centralized clearinghouse will allow us to understand where solar is happening and allow us to calculate and know about impacted lands, acreage, soil types, and other important trends. Our second, the second solar stakeholder recommendation has to do with the dual use program. And it advocates that the legislature uh, move forward with a pilot program that studies dual use projects in the state of Maine. The department is in support of this uh, because while there's a lot of interest in dual use potential in Maine, we have to truth check that. We have to be able to conduct research on dual use to understand what are the compatible crops and livestock in Maine and determine whether or not there's enough viability in those models to generate farmer interest uh, in dual use energy generation going forward. And importantly, because the stakeholder recommendations often speak to dual use in addition to this recommendation number two, we think it's very key that a dual use pilot program be instigated because it has to prove out whether or not some of these other recommendations um, would be viable. So we feel that this is somewhat of a, a gatekeeper and needs to move forward in order to prove out the other recommendations. The third stakeholder recommendation is a consideration of current use taxation. And what they mean by that is to eliminate the existing tax penalty that is assessed when and if a farmland decides to remove itself from farmland current use taxation. You folks might be aware that um, you can sign up as a, 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 a farmer, as farmland, to um, protect yourself from certain um, taxes um, provided you enter into the current use model. If you cease farming, the uh, tax benefits are eliminated and in fact you have to pay a penalty. So what this would do is eliminate that tax penalty if farmland actually allows for solar development, in particular dual use solar development on site, so that because farm farming activities are still occurring while solar is concurrent, there should be no tax penalty. We are supportive of this uh, recommendation, again, um, contingent that dual use projects are proven to be viable through that pilot project. Stakeholder recommendation number four is considering standards for dual use and co-location in permit by rule review, also known as PBR review. So uh, permit by rule st standards, um, let me rephrase, excuse me. So essentially what a PBR would do is to allow for a more truncated review process of um, solar uh, applications um, provided that they were uh, for dual use or co-location type of um, activities for solar. We believe um, that offering this type of permit by rule review um, would incentivize uh, developers to include more agriculture friendly design considerations into their project. There's a benefit for having a less onerous review process. So um, if they see that as a benefit, they wouldn't be incorporating dual use or co-location practices into the design. We would also ask that, however, this permit by rule review process apply to proposals beyond dual use, but to include those that are proposed on marginal agricultural land, contaminated land, also known as brownfields, and unfortunately our emerging issue around PFAS in the state of Maine, will have contaminated land available for that as well. Also consideration of proposals on rooftops, gravel pits, pre and previously developed parcels, so that by prioritizing and incentivizing projects on those locations, we can avoid valuable agricultural land being turned into um, uh, solar arrays. The fifth recommendation is the development of hosting capacity maps. These are technical maps that would help developers become more efficient 
at uh, targeting their site selection uh, for all sizes of solar projects. We support this. Again, this comes down to data. Uh, we find that and believe that comprehensive data uh, indicating which areas of the grid are saturated and those that actually have capacity for additional interconnections would help minimize land use stress and could help developers understand how to minimize interconnection costs, which would ideally increase their ability to choose and pursue higher cost dual use or co-location sites. The sixth recommendation is increased support for, for municipal planning capacity. We have heard loud and clear that uh, many municipalities would like more assistance in um, reviewing and considering solar within their communities. It is a very technical and complex process. And so technical assistance and or financial support for that planning um, could be provided uh, by the department and uh, possibly by the government, governor's energy office directly to municipalities, council and councils of governments. So we are in support of this. And the seventh recommendation from the solar stakeholder report was consideration of program preference based on agricultural site characteristics. What this means is in future state procurement processes for solar, um, which would potentially consider long, uh, long range contracts or compensation mechanisms, we would want there to be consideration of agricultural siting characteristics as part of that review process. Currently, there is a distributed generation stakeholder group that is considering site characteristics. And we ask, and this was asked of by this report as well, that this stakeholder group um, do exactly that, that they um, think about agricultural siting characteristics and include agricultural group members to participate in that effort. So putting a finer point on it from the department's perspective, we believe that having the PUC evaluate and score proposed projects, agricultural and natural resource impacts can encourage well-designed and well-cited projects that limit impacts to valuable agricultural lands. We also, in addition to ag lands, however, encourage that that procurement process include other criteria assessing whether the project is located in the built environment on brownfields or contaminated lands and whether it will be a dual use or co-location process. So as I just mentioned in going through those seven recommendations, the department is in support of those recommendations with some finer points overlaid here and there. But we would also uh, draw the committee's uh, attention to additional policy recommendations for further consideration um, that were not included in the Ag Solar Stakeholder Report. One such recommendation is for considering an in lieu fee program. In lieu fee is a mechanism where if uh, significant environmental impacts upon natural resources, or in this case, agricultural resources can't be avoided by development, the developer pays a mitigation fee. That fee is then utilized to protect uh, other resources such as natural resources, wildlife habitat, or in our case, uh, farmland protection elsewhere in the state. And uh, in lieu fee is not a new concept. There is an in lieu fee mechanism already within uh, the DEP's um, uh, st statutory oversight um, relating to wetlands. We also believe that more needs to be done to educate a broad swath of folks within the state about the importance of soils. We need to enhance the general understanding of developers, policymakers such as yourselves, the general public about the importance of our farmland so soils and what opportunities are lost when those soils are converted um, into non-agricultural use. That we see uh, as being a very important role for our new healthy soils program, which will be getting underway in 2022. Um, but we really need to call attention to the importance of healthy agricultural soils in the state. And also underlying a lot of our, our, our observations and recommendations around agriculture, uh, not to be forgotten is, gener is generally speaking natural resources. When considering potential impacts from solar siting, we want there to be consideration of natural resources more broadly. Th that term includes important wildlife and fisheries habitat, rare plant populations, and rare uh, natural communities. So where do we go from here? Um, 
in, in thinking about how to prioritize action steps, um, the department believes that uh, three of the seven recommendations um, certainly can be looked at uh, sooner rather than later. First would be um, getting together the resources necessary to establish the centralized clearinghouse on solar development information. We also believe that the dual use pilot program is very necessary to start uh, designing, digging into and building out uh, on, on paper at the very least so that we can then come back with a proposal around how to uh, get that stood up um, in the near future. And we also believe that it's important to provide municipal solar assistance uh, sooner rather than later. We also encourage further analysis of in lieu fee uh, mechanisms uh, focusing on solar development on agricultural land. We also request that the existing distributed generation stakeholder group fully assess agricultural and natural resource siting characteristics, as well as compensation mechanisms um, that uh, really uh, would um, favor dual use um, and co-location um, and, and or avoidance of, the, of those locations. And we also do ask that agricultural representation actively engage in that stakeholder group process. And then underpinning um, a number of these recommendations is the support of a full-time department position to successfully implement these recommendations. This is not a capacity that we currently have within the department and in order to be as successful as possible moving forward with all things solar policy related and with the intersection of agriculture, we really do ask for support to establish a full-time position in that arena. And I'm gonna end there and Commissioner Beal and I would be happy to answer questions. And don't forget that um, Selena Cunningham is also here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dale, and thank you, Commissioner Beal and Director McBrady for being here. This is a very interesting. I, I've had, as you probably have guessed, some concerns with, about solar and agricultural land for quite some time. And I am uh, particularly pleased that that this study in this, this format is taking place. And I am also very pleased to, uh, to think about the brownfield or contaminated soil sites that might be applicable for solar. And I'm wondering, uh, <clears throat> do you have any idea how many acres of that particular type, gravel pits, uh, uh, PFAS soil contaminated sites that might be suitable for, for solar arrays currently? Uh, or is that just continually part of the study? I think that's an important, important piece right there. Thank you. Maybe Nancy can speak more to the discussion in the stakeholder group, but I would say that, you know, that that number is still something that we are uh, where it's in development. I mean, as you know, we're just at the beginning of uh, investigating, investigating PFAS contamination. And so I think that number will change over time. Thank yes, you. It seems, to me that, it seems to me that uh, if I were a farmer and uh, we all know the struggles that they are having to undergo today, um, it's a very lucrative thing to have someone offer me a, a, a lease or whatever. So I, I won't have to milk cows or shovel there, whatever that comes out of cows anymore and get paid every week or month or year or whatever. And I think that we need to just be really, really, really careful about this. And those, those particular properties that are having problems, uh, those are the ones we should really focus on. And I, I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. But that's okay, Representative. Um, what I would say is that the main Audubon uh, tool um, does actually have an overlay of uh, some of that information around brownfields, as I recall. Um, I can't speak to whether or not it quantifies it. It may. Um, that's something that we can let you know about. Happy to follow up with you about it. And with respect to what Commissioner Beal just mentioned, um, there is uh, certainly an understanding on, of where uh, sludge application was permitted to occur, but there's a lot that still needs to be done to truth check that 
and then to capture um, the, the resulting information, acreage, et cetera, in a easily understandable and accessible manner. If I could have one more quick follow-up, Senator Dill. Sure. I'm just curious, I passed by the uh, solar site in Farmington a few days ago, and there was an appreciable amount of snow on, on those panels. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any idea how many inches of snow, uh, how many inches of snow needs to pile up before they become virtually ineffective. I suspect an inch of snow might have an impact, but I don't know that. So I'm just curious. There was probably a, a foot of snow and we've, we've seen some more today. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any idea when those become ineffective due to snow. I do not know the answer to that. I, I do not either. I wonder if maybe Selena Cunningham from the governor's energy office might have some insight and maybe she could come through and answer anything, any questions that are energy or solar specific. Sure, we'll sure. ask uh, Cheryl to bring Selena in, but I'll move on to Representative Pluka while she's coming in, in case she gets stuck in cyberspace. So, Representative Thank Pluka. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask about the position that we you specifically mentioned, Director McBrady, at the end. The, the, can that position accomplish those three points you outlined at the end of the report between pursuing development of the centralized clearinghouse, the establishment of a robust dual use pilot program, as well as helping the municipalities with their solar planning? Um, I think at the very least that person can can get the kickoff going um, in those arenas that's desperately needed. Uh, we think that ideally if we could move forward with the pilot program that I think would be a, a, a very um, time consuming but uh, important area of activity. Um, and we'll just have to see the capacity um, of, of those three priorities. Um, and, you know, we may be needing to build this out over time, but it would be a great start to have a full time person doing all three. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, in terms of the, the municipal support, it might not be that we, this person could go out and go to every uh, planning board meeting, but could be looking at developing resources and looking at what's happening in other places and be sort of a clearinghouse for information that would help with those um, community level decisions. Great, I completely agree. And I'd, I'd love to see somebody like that at the department. Do you know if you've, I'm, I'm sure you do know, if you've requested a position in the supplemental budget, do we have any inklings as to whether this needs to happen through legislative initiative or if it's happening from the executive side? Um, well, I can say that, you know, the, the coming together of this report was sort of late in the process of developing uh, the budget. And so it wasn't in our initial request because the, the report wasn't done yet. So that's something we might need to talk about more. Great. Thank you. And a follow up, Mr. Chair? Yes, one follow up. Thank you. Last one. I see there in your in near your, your second to last paragraph, it mentions the distributed generation stakeholder group and getting our cultural representation on that group. Is there currently representation and, and is there a way to make sure that we are being represented in that conversation? Um, I don't know whether that ha that connect that connectivity, that connection of ag has happened as of yet with that uh, stakeholder group, but I would certainly defer to um, Selena uh, and, and to provide an update on that stakeholder group process in general. Sure, thank you, thank you for the, the, the question, Representative and, and Nancy. Um, as mentioned, I'm Selena Cunningham, Deputy Director in the Governor's Energy Office, and the legislature tasked the Governor's Energy Office with uh, standing up a distributed generation stakeholder group to explore um, the next, um, uh, the development of the next uh, uh, distributed generation program for the state of Maine. And that includes a number of components when looking about at how to shape the future program. An important part of that is obviously related to siting and agricultural work that we're talking about here. The Governor's Energy Office and the stakeholder group submitted an initial report to the EUT committee in, uh, I believe, last month. As 
part of that, we outlined a plan for how we plan to develop the uh, work of this committee over, over the stakeholder group over the next year. Um, our final report is due at the end of 2020, at the end of the year in 2023. And as a part of that, we plan to hold listening sessions um, to make sure that we are bringing in voices that aren't necessarily fully represented on the stakeholder group, such as the agricultural community, to make sure that as we consider any sort of policy recommendations in this area, we have representation from those areas of focus. So we'll continue to coordinate with the ACF going forward um, and make sure that agricultural members um, are part of future conversations around solar siting and agriculture. Director Cunningham, do you know the answer to Representative Schofield's question about inches of snow and you know the impact on solarization? Oh uh, yes, thank you. So uh, I don't know the specific uh, in terms of the number of feet that can be Im impact the um, the output. Um, generally, in the short term, uh, the snow can reduce generation output. But um, what we do know is that panels shed snow relatively quickly and continue to play an important role in our energy portfolio. Thank you. Representative Underwood. Yes, thank you, uh, Senator Dale. Uh, basically, what I was interested in is a dual use of a farm, for example, like a potato farm. If someone, if a farmer decided to use some of this land to locate a solar array, and then down the road, say three or four years, they decided this wasn't for them, they were going to go back and uh, plant potatoes again. Um, what happens is that, I assume that's possible. Is, is that correct? Or once it becomes solar, is it always solar? Sure, Representative Underwood, that's a really great question. Um, so at the outset, entering into solar development on the limited land is a legal contract. So um, someone changing their, their opinion or desire to uh, no longer do that would be something that they'd have to you know, work with their solar developer uh, to, to untangle, if you will. But um, if I could speak to dual use, the, the hope is that we can prove out that thoughtful siting of arrays that can accommodate equipment, um, access to crops, uh, allowance of, uh, and, and allows for a, product, a productive yield might eventually bear out to be very attractive and profitable for farmers to do. We're not there yet. We need to study this further. But the hope is that a, that type of dual use commitment works out for both the farmer and the developer. Um, and I might just want to ask Selena to speak to decommissioning um, and what that entails when the you know, useful life of the solar array has ended or solar is no longer needed at that particular location, what that might entail. Yes, thanks. So it's important to note that the state's existing decommissioning law um, is administered by DEP and does require solar projects um, constructed on farm farmland to have a plan approved by DEP, um, including uh, financial assurance um, that would require um, the, the, the owner to restore the solar owner to restore the land to agricultural viability um, following decommissioning whenever that may occur. Um, this was passed, uh, I believe, in the last legislative session sponsored by Senator Black. Thank you very much. Could I put a, just a little bit finer point on the dual use uh, idea? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, since you're not stopping me. Um, I just wanted to, to be more specific. I think one of the reasons why we really feel like we need the capacity to do some research here in the state is that we do know that there are uh, dual use research projects going on in other places, but you know, Maine has its own climate, soils, you know, unique characteristics, and we would want to really make sure that whatever kinds of models are available to farmers are going to really work well here. Uh, and some other things that we would be interested in knowing more about is 
perhaps you know in a livestock system, uh, if you're grazing animals, what what is the quality and quantity of forage that can be produced uh, under solar panels? And likewise, if you're producing other crops, what what does the production and quality look like uh, when you're growing in a dual use system? And also, you know, is the is it a financially economic or an economically viable model for farmers to um, to integrate the two. And so I, I think that there's a lot of um, good information out there that's pointing to some promising uh, practices, but to be able to demonstrate that here in Maine would I think go a long way toward both uh, showing what's possible and encouraging farmers to uh, replicate these models. Great, thank you. Representative Barry, welcome. Thank you so much, Senator Dill. Um, thank you to the ACF uh, department and, and committee for this really important discussion. It's been uh, great to hear <clears throat> this update and, and to think about how it meshes with the work that's going on in our committee. Um, <clears throat> uh, just uh, kind of a little background from our side of the fence, if you will. <laughs> um, there, there is a great deal of value in solar uh, farms that from a carbon um, standpoint. They do, as much as I love forests, um, they do actually sequester more carbon, considerably more carbon than forest land does. Uh, but, you know, as, as has been noted, it's incredibly important that we use our uh, prime soils appropriately because we have relatively uh, limited uh, prime agricultural soils here in Maine and, and some, not all forest is created equal either for that matter. So I think this is an incredibly important opportunity to really get it right, to make sure that we're um, strategic uh, and, and precise in, in what we encourage where. And I think our committees will have to to, to not work in the usual silos in order to make this uh, happen properly. And, and I, I'm, I just really wanna commend the, the Governor's Energy Office and the department for, for leading the charge and making sure that we do work across those um, traditional uh, boundaries. So um, just a couple quick points of clarification um, with uh, net metering and what we call distributed generation or DG, um, that is traditionally in Maine, it's defined as, as five megawatts or lower. And we're actually really uh, reducing the so-called net metering incentives down to two megawatts um, or lower going forward. So to put that in perspective, um, five megawatts is a roughly 20 acres maximum. And, uh, and a two megawatts, which we're going towards is, is eight acres maximum, give or, um, and I'm using ballpark numbers here, um, but even with the, the fencing and, and associated infrastructure, you're unlikely to need more than um, eight acres going forward for those two megawatt projects. Um, another clarifying point I just want to add is um, snow is not really a problem. It is temporarily, and there's certain kinds of snow, like this really sticky, thick stuff that built, started with ice that we had recently that does tend to accumulate on the panels and stay there. But for the most part, it either um, blows off quickly or slides off quickly. And once there's even a little bit of, of uh, black showing, um, even if it just begins to slide, that heats up the panel and it, and it really um, melts off the rest very quickly. So, and they're really designed for that. So snow is not really an issue. Um, and I just want to touch quickly on mapping. Um, it, it's, it's easy to, underestimate the importance of the grid in this mapping exercise. The electrical grid is a critical um, aspect of this because for the average solar developer, um, it really limits what you can build where. Um, the, the, the grid, because of the, the um, building that's been going on, the grid is already at capacity in many, many areas. And you really need to be near a, a space on the electrical grid where you can actually, um, you know, connect and the grid can handle it, right, without overloading. Um, so I think that piece of the mapping will be really important as we go forward and, and figure out what can go where. Um, the utilities don't always seem to know themselves exactly where the opportunities are. And then they also have to be willing to share it. 
and then it has to be put into um, a form that the you know the farmers and the uh, solar developers and the public and and of course uh, you know policymakers can can readily use. So there's work to do here. This is not a small thing, and so I I certainly support the the the, the general um, notion that we might need an additional um, staff person um, at ACF to do this important work. Um, and lastly, I'll just offer up that I, I, I do have a, a concept draft before your committee. I think it's LD856. I'm happy to see that used if it's helpful in um, refining and developing some of these uh, recommendations um, that came out of LD820. So I'll stop there and, and um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to um, offer that up. Thank you. Representative Blucher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to follow up with uh, Ms. Cunningham on, is it necessary to change statute in order to get agricultural representation on the, on the stakeholder group? Or is that just a rule that you can change your, within the governor's energy office? Thank you for the question. So the members of of the um, of the distributed generation group were set by statute. However, we have the ability to, to hold additional uh, listening sessions and meetings with relevant uh, constituencies and stakeholders on different topics. And so we plan on actively doing that um, to address issues. And I I think what we tried to do is ensure that the the um, core members of the distributed generation group are um, uh, focused on the. Uh, for instance, we're looking at cost benefit analysis of solar and other components of the of the solar um, development of a solar program that may not be relevant to the agricultural community specifically. However, we want to make sure that we bring in those voices um, and in ways during the conversation to be most relevant and useful. And we're happy to, you know, if you have additional thoughts on how we do that, we're happy to, to have conversations around that. But we do believe we have the authority uh, to to bring in those voices for those conversations. I was just going to clarify. So you have the authority to bring in to have listening groups with farmers in them, but you don't have the authority to add uh, uh, our cultural representative to the group. We we could add um, additional members to this the group um, if needed. So uh, we can certainly uh, take a look at that to make sure that we have um, the correct representation to address these issues. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Foster. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and Commissioner Beal and Ms. McGrady, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's good to see that since the early days of the 130th, when we had an informational uh, session with EUT, that uh, so how much work has been done on this. Uh, a lot of answers. I know back then we I discussed uh, the big solar project in Milo that where a probably the, at, in its day was the largest uh, potato farm south of uh, Rooster County. Uh, where that that uh, array now sets and, and concerns that I had about that. Uh, there, there are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I greatly appreciate uh, you speaking to the dual use uh, uh, analysis that, you know, we need to find out for sure. And you already named off a few things, Commissioner, on, you know, what are the important things we need to look at? Because obviously in the end, the farmer has got to be able to make money on that land. And uh, we have to realize uh, that allowing uh, solar development there is still uh, uh, keeping both uh, opportunities going. Uh, and the only way that can happen is if they are making uh, money, whether it's grazing underneath the panels or growing blueberries. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, I, I would just touch on that you didn't talk about in the report. Uh, one is, uh, I think you alluded to it, but obviously, uh, Having a solar array leased on leased farmland has become a very lucrative uh, proposition for farmers who previously had crops growing there. In other words, it's much more uh, of, a, of an advantage to them income-wise. Uh, whether they are leasing land to a farmer currently, uh, as some people do, that don't farm the land or that it's a farmer that owns the land, uh, we've put them in a position where that they, they have to make a choice and uh, quite frankly, I, I, I'm, my question along that line would be, are we suggesting that we will, through uh, rulemaking and or legislation statute, 
not allow farmers to make that choice if they happen to have uh, a good cropland. The second piece of that is, uh, you know, how did we get here? Well, how we got here, in spite of what some people would like us to believe, it's because of how lucrative uh, these uh, uh, benefits are that uh, our farmers are receiving for uh, leasing land for these solar arrays. And uh, I think, for example, uh, a farmer who has good crop land can make uh, a large uh, uh, income from doing so versus uh, a less lucrative uh, uh, solar allowance, if you will, or payment, uh, he would probably tend to use land that he couldn't grow crops on or make that available. Uh, so I'm wondering, was that considered as part of the project? In other words, what we now offer through statute, uh, through uh, uh, payments, uh, both uh, from taxpayers and ratepayers, uh, makes, makes it uh, a, a difficult situation for us to uh, try to secure that farmland. Uh, so my question is, did, was that looked at? Is there something we need to do there, especially as we look at distributed generation uh, uh, mod two? Uh, if you will, and also, uh, are you? Am I reading from your report that indeed we are going to look at passing legislation that says, for a farmer who's got good crop land, sorry, you're not going to be able to uh, to put it, to take the benefit uh, and site solar there. Thank you. So, who wants to answer that one, Commissioner? I'm happy to, Director. I'm happy to All right. Commissioner Beal, if you would like me to start with that, you can jump in to, to add. Um, so Representative Foster, I don't believe that any of the recommendations um, have the effect of essentially saying you may not site solar on a farm. What the recommendations are doing are trying to build out policies that might incentivize people to site more thoughtfully in avoidance of particular agricultural soils so that developers would pursue those locations more readily than not through those policy levers. Um, again, a, a regulatory process that's faster. Perhaps there's some adder that they get through the procurement process, um, or perhaps they, again, and I'm speaking somewhat outside of my, my knowledge base, but allowing for more attractive rates uh, for them if they pursue those locations they might not want to pursue that after all, but um, it would be there as a policy incentive should those uh, be stood up um, as we've suggested they be considered in the recommendations. But at the end of the day, there is not legislation or a recommendation right now that says you may not cite anything on agricultural soils. Is there anything else that you would like to add to that commissioner? No, I, well, I would just say, yeah, I echo what Nancy's saying about, you know, we want farmers to have choices. We want them to be able to make their own decisions. We're not looking to take that opportunity away. Um, and one of the things that uh, Nancy touched on and was talked about both with the stakeholder group and in other venues is the idea of there being some kind of a mitigation fee so that if, you know, placing a solar array on prime farmland soils is unavoidable, um, that there's some kind of a, a payment that goes to perhaps protecting farmland in some other location so that we're at least um, there's some kind of a proactive benefit to apply to uh, protecting farmland elsewhere. If yeah, I may, uh, yes, follow up, sure. So I, I think uh, I would only say that uh, obviously if we could all go back even though some of us had great concerns and when, when we were passing legislation to incentivize uh, solar development, if we had looked at all of these issues, we may have approached this differently where that uh, land use would have been one of the key things we would look at. And that would have been easier to incentivize at the beginning than change it now. Uh, and, and I just think that as we look at uh, future distributed generation uh, plans and statute, uh, it's this is the time to uh, to make sure we address those going forward as especially considering that uh, the governor's energy office is looking at 
uh, around 45,000 acres of solar panels by, uh, by the year 2050 to uh, meet the uh, required generation uh, that uh, they're looking at for, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see we have four more hands up and then we have to move on to our work session. So with that, I'll go to Representative Underwood. My question revol re re revolves resolves around uh, disposal of these panels, the life and, and disposal of panels. How long are these panels supposed to last and how are they going to be disposed <clears throat> of? Does, does they contain any PFAS or any other chemicals that are hard to dispose of? Who wants to take that? I see Commissioner, Director Brady and Cunningham's both. I'm, I'll, I'll very quickly pass it over to Selena, um, but, but just would refer again, there is, there is decommissioning statute on the books uh, around uh, that type of work. And I hope Selena might be able to speak to that. Thank you. Sure, uh, thank you for the question, Representative. So the, uh, Projects typically can be uh, contracted for 20 years or more. Um, and there are, as I mentioned, decommissioning requirements that are set in place by DEP. Um, in addition to that, there are um, a variety of ways that the, um, the, the solar uh, industry will plan on either reusing, refurbishing, recycling, or otherwise uh, 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 disposing of the panels. Um, there are uh, uh, very, there are limited uh, number of, of um, uh, ingredients or chemicals that maybe need to be disposed of properly um, so that there are standards for the industry to to work through those issues. So um, it's uh, uh, an ongoing conversation about how to continue to support um, recycling of, of solar panels, um, and we'll, we'll continue to look into that. Thank you. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, Representative Barry made a good point a few minutes ago about solar in some areas is probably at its saturation point and in other places it's it's still ongoing. And I'm wondering if, if in this process that we should somehow incentivize uh, solar to be put where there is the, the brown fields or the contaminated sites. And I'm not saying it'll work in all cases, but if, if we have contaminated sites that are non-agricultural or cannot be agricultural, if there's a way somehow on the list of priorities, if we can somehow incentivize the use of those lands over ongoing operable agriculture properties, just, just to throw that out. Uh, we're gonna, I guess we're looking at another several thousand solar panels in the next few years. And I'm thinking that's something that ought to be sort of inching towards the priority using those contaminated sites when at all possible and maybe incentivizing the, the need for that. Thank you. Anyone want to comment on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Representative, for the question. I think you're absolutely right. And that's the kind of conversation we want to have in the distribution about how to uh, the this future distributed generation program for the state. Where should we be looking, looking at incentivizing solar development? How do we do that in a way that is cost effective for main ratepayers as well? And that's something that we need to balance. One thing that I do think is important to point out is in order to meet the state's climate goals, we need to nearly double our um, electricity over the next, um, over the coming years. And so we will need additional projects that or I'm sorry, um, more renewable energy that will likely um, be greater than the number of brownfields available today. And so how do we balance that for when we do go beyond brownfields or other sites, how do we balance that development is something that we wanna pursue and, and continue to look into. Thank you. And we'll finish up with Representative Barry. Great, thank you. And and um, I, I, I strongly agree that PFAS land seems like um, an excellent candidate for the siting of solar, <clears throat> as well as the characterization that there are some places in the grid that could handle more solar. I, um, I, I spoke earlier about our policies for, and Re Representative Foster alluded to this as well, our policies for um, what's called DG, 
uh, which gets a, a, a different treatment uh, for rate making purposes. And, and so there are different economics for the developer. Um, there also will be many larger grid scale projects that comprise uh, a much, much greater parcels of land and require much greater parcels of land. So um, I think I think the economics of those kinds of projects will provide different opportunities and um, different considerations for land use as well. Um, so, you know, I just want to add a little more color to my thinking about how we can go forward from this report. Um, it seems to me that the permit by rule piece is very promising. Um, and um, I, I love that it, the initials are PBR. Um, we, we, uh, we think of PBR as performance-based rate making in our committee, but uh, permit by rule will work well, or if, if there's a beer you like and it uh, you know, has those initials, that's fine too. Uh, but PBR seems very important, uh, and I'd like to go forward with that. Um, I'm interested in uh, asking the department, the ACF department, to do additional um, planning for a dual-use pilot project. Um, very supportive of that initiative. And I do think this database piece, um, including spatial data, is very important to develop as well so that we can make these um, important decisions um, with with full knowledge of what's involved. So um, I hope that we can go forward with that. And, and it seems to me that the ACF committee will be essential in the department as well um, to make sure that, that that happens and that we can be thoughtful and strategic uh, about renewable energy siting, particular solar siting um, going forward. So thank you again. Great, thank you. Um, as uh... Representative Barry pointed out he does have LD 856 um, that we haven't scheduled yet for public hearing. And I think I might suggest to the committee that when we have that public hearing, since it is a concept draft, this may be the time to roll in whatever we want from our discussion today <clears throat> into that bill so we don't have to turn around and, and necessarily report anything out from the committee. Um, our own bill or that type of thing. However, we do have that in the resolve that we can do that. So that would be my uh, suggestion that we schedule when we schedule that, we just roll this discussion into that. Representative Barry, did you wanna comment on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I think that sounds like an excellent way to proceed. And I would offer if, if the committee would like, uh, the ACF committee, I mean, um, I'm happy to work with your legislative analyst and put some meat on the bones to the concept draft. So you can put, send that out to interested parties and to committee members in advance of the hearing and, um, you know, have a, a more um, intelligent discussion um, than my, my very vague language would otherwise uh, provide. For. Right. And as you, as we usually do, we also ask uh, Karen, our analysts to uh, also work with the department on that too. So between the three groups, if, uh, we can put something together to react to that would be great and we'll be scheduling that probably in a couple of weeks so i'll get right on all right any other comments parting comments questions all right well thank you uh for that excellent presentation and everybody's participation on it we do have uh four work sessions coming up um it's 112 why don't we take uh, 113 actually why don't we take a 12 minute break and we'll start at 125 um, with the work sessions. And we'll give everybody a chance to maybe grab a quick snack or something before we continue. Thank you. We'll see you in 12 minutes.
Hey, Dave. Hey there. How are you? Good yourself. Not bad. I think you and you and the education committee are uh, uh, working together to make sure my day is full. It was right, <laughs> right on scream uh, until I joined you here. But the good thing is, I got here for five minutes, and you took a twelve-minute break. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was feeling you know generous today because usually I don't take a break, but well, yeah, well you kind of had to with the schedule you've got today. I know with four more work sessions, I don't know how yeah. long they'll go. So I was you know normally we don't have four through the afternoon. Uh, boy, if I can just get get out of bed in time to <clears> leave, <throat> uh, that'd be good. So I did. I did. Jim, are we going to take these right in order that we have them listed? Yeah. Okay. No one's asked for anything differently or anything. No. So, no, that's what I kind of thought. Yeah. But, you know, back to that whole solar thing, you know, you got to stop and think about we're talking about all uh, private land on that. And uh, I know what we, we put 40 acres and going to start a solar array. Uh, this this summer they're going to put it up, and we checked with the local um, potato farm just to see an idea what they was was paying for uh, acreage rental, and the solar guys are paying us 15 times as much as we could rent that land out for. So I know a lot of it comes down to the bottom dollar. It's you know pretty pretty easy money. It's pretty tempting. Right. right. Very tempting. Right. Oh, Randy, I, I wasn't there for yeah. the whole discussion there or much of it. So are you prohibited from using that land in between or underneath? Uh, well, what it is, is we actually leased the property to them for for 20 years with the option to, to go out further. But the uh, the solar panels are actually the, the life expectancy of them is 20 years. So you right. go on a 20 year, 20 year lease. And they are talking about doing some of that uh, dual dual purpose. The only thing they found so far is uh, this is a company out of Minnesota that's doing ours. And uh, they find that the only thing that's working is, is sheep because sheep won't jump up onto the panels. And we asked about like if they could pasture goats or anything underneath them because of course that whole piece of property is going to be fenced. So, I mean, it could be easily grazed, but they say goats will get up on the panels and, and oh, walk yeah. on them in it. And that uh, causes damage to them. But sheep, sheep is fine. But they're finding that, of course, underneath the panels with no sunlight underneath the panel, you know, you get very limited amount of vegetation that grows. But uh, right now they are working, you know, pasturing sheep on them. But the only thing is, what value are the sheep? You know, that's that's the problem. So they're awful you know, good eating, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bring my well, own. That could be your opinion, but I've had some before, and I'm not I'm not a big fan <laughs> myself. So, <laughs> oh, you get into that a lot. Don't for, don't forget, we're still on audio and YouTube here, folks. So, uh, but it is 1:25, and it's time to get right, going. That's right. time when we said we'd sure. start. <clears throat> we do have four work sessions for this afternoon, and to try to um, go ahead and get through these, uh, we'll try to stay on somewhat of a schedule here. So we'll open the work session on LD-174 and act to implement the recommendations of the Ending Hunger by 2.30 Advisory Group. And I'll turn it over to Cam Bill, uh, Representative Pluka, do you have a question? My video has been turned off by the host, if they can turn it back on. Oh. Don't know how that happened. Thank you. We'll blame it on Cheryl, of course, so. Oh, with that, anyway, Karen, I'll turn it over to you while they're trying to resolve uh, Representative Pluka's video. There we go. 
thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, this bill is a concept draft and the summary says it proposes to implement the recommendations of the advisory group assembled uh, pursuant to resolve 2019 chapter 32 to end hunger in Maine by 2030. So you received only uh, testimony in support of the concept. Um, we uh, represent Pluker is the sponsor of LD 174 and he did talk about uh, an amendment that he's been working on with the department and um, the governor's office of policy innovation in the future and other interested parties. So um, I guess I can uh, go over the amendment. I don't, you haven't received a copy of it yet or uh, you know, Representative Pluker can go through it uh, if he would like. Yeah, I think if you could send that amendment out, Karen, so everybody can see it and then we'd probably invite Craig to kind of uh, speak to the report and which I think also was sent out a couple days ago, the final report and talk about the work that we see going forward. Okay, uh, Senator Deal, would you like me to screen share the amendment? That might yes, be please, so that way easier. everybody can see it because. Okay. All right, are you seeing it now? Yes. All right, so um, essentially what uh, the proposal does, um, and this, you heard this at the public hearing from the department, um, they asked to move the work of the plan, um, and the plan they're talking about is, you got a, a draft report in January prior to the public hearing, uh, everyone at the table, Maine's plan to end hunger by 2030. Um, you got it mid-January, and then just this morning, I forwarded the final report um, to, to the committee, but um, the department in their testimony asked to move the work of the plan to the governor's office of planning innovation and the future, GOPIF, and um, their thinking was that this uh, would be better placed in GOPIF. They could act as the, the lead agency where interdepartmental work could be executed by bringing together resources and data from across the state. So that's what the amendment does. Um, section one of the amendment, you'll see it amends Title V, Section 3104A, Subsection 2, Duties of the Office. The office is GOPIF. And so it adds um, the paragraph F, um, where GOPIF acts as the lead agency um, to implement a strategic plan to end hunger in the state. Um, and I, I won't go through those right now, um, the, the specific uh, strategies. Um, and then the second piece is in paragraph G of the amendment. Um, also, this is so this would be an additional additional duty of GOPIF. Uh, it requires GOPIF to establish an advisory committee to guide the implementation of the strategic plan and to submit a report to uh, various joint standing committees of the legislature um, no later than January 1st of each year until 2030 regarding activities and progress made toward ending hunger in the state by 2030. Um, and so if you see in the, in the body of the amendment, some of the committees are, you know, obviously agriculture, food and resources. So this would be the ACF committee, health and human services, labor and housing, transportation and economic and community development. And then finally, um, in section two of the amendment, this is an unallocated section um, that directs GOPIF to implement the strategies to build infrastructure and increase capacity to end hunger in the state as outlined in the report, everyone at the table means plan to end hunger by 2030. Um, so that is the gist of the amendment. Okay, so first I will go to Representative Pluker. Anything you wanna comment on it, Representative? I think the, <clears throat> the action of this bill is, is a relatively simple one. It's moving the work as outlined in the report to go PIF, it's creating a position so that work can continue. Um, and so I'm hoping that it, you know, it's just a simple bill that way. Okay. And I'll go to Craig Lapine to see what he'd like to add to the discussion. 
Um, not much, I, I guess I would say the, um, and, and I do apologize that it was so recently that you got the final draft of the plan, but you do have it. And, and there are essentially five overarching goals in the plan. Um, and only one of them really has to do with food, which is why the, you know, which is sort of the, the genesis of the idea that perhaps the work could be better coordinated somewhere else. The first goal is to establish the capacity to do the work. The second goal is around making sure everybody has enough food. Um, and the third one is really about economic development and creating the conditions in the state so far fewer people are living on the margins and, and, and can't meet their own needs and to create a, you know, to create a scenario where more people are simply earning enough money so that they're not relying on emergency food or the charitable food system. Um, and so that, that's really the, the, the genesis of the idea that because it's cross cutting. Um, and even as the original bill that then Representative Hickman drafted, which named um, uh, quite a few agencies that we were supposed to collaborate with in developing the plan, which included labor and health and human services and transportation and veterans affairs. Um, in fact, all of those entities, as we went out and talked to them and pulled this planning process together, all of those entities do have a role to play in solving this problem and, and just the thought that the governor's office is a better place to coordinate that kind of interdepartmental work. This seems to be a, a very lofty goal, but uh, you know certainly a needed goal. Do you think that in eight years it is doable? I do. I do. I mean, it is absolutely ambitious. Um, and I guess I'll also say that, um, you know, the legislation gave it to the department to come up with a plan that could get us there. And I do think that that's what this is. Um, are the resources there? Is the political will? That's a bit, I guess, above my pay grade. I think this is the roadmap, though, <laughs> that would do it if we chose to do it. And, um, and you know, one thing that we saw during the pandemic, uh, to be honest, is that when some additional resources were added to the system, we did see food insecurity numbers dropping and dropping pretty quickly, which is a little bit counterintuitive. But, but we did see, you know, the state and the federal government took some moves that did that. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. In fact, I'm pretty optimistic. Great, thank you. Uh, Senator Maxman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I'm really excited about this bill. I've had a lot of friends who were part of the stakeholder process and just heard really great things about how inclusive and representative it's been. So um, kudos to everyone for that. And I would like to move OTPA. Uh, to pass as amended as amended. Okay. It's been seconded by Representative O'Neill. We will continue with discussion. Senator Black, did you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my question was uh, to the department. Um, we all know that in Maine, we have a lot of wasted land um, and infrastructure. Some We don't have enough infrastructure, but we could have to become the breadbasket that we were 60 years ago. Is, is this um, bill going to address, um, I, I can't remember uh, in, in the previous uh, uh, part of the bill, whether it addressed uh, promoting local agriculture and infrastructure to process food uh, it, to alleviate hunger within our state that way or whether we're gonna haul it in on trucks and planes and whatever else. Oh, and it, it absolutely does. And I will yield to Director McBrady as well if she has more to add, but um, I would direct you to uh, goal B in the plan and strategy four, which really is about strengthening the local food system um, as a part of this solution. Um, and of course, that's very much in line with the department's objectives and, um, you know, the current agriculture infrastructure, infrastructure investment program 
that we're rolling out with ARPA funds and the Agriculture, Food and Forest Products Investment Fund, which we hope to roll out soon. Um, that, that is definitely a place where I think the, the objectives of this plan and the already existing objectives of the department very much line up. Representative Underwood. Thank you. This sounds like uh, if you're going to end motherhood, you can possibly, it isn't going to happen. It's the same thing with ending hunger. It isn't going to happen. And I think the goal of, that's been specified to end hunger is not possible. This is just another bill to create a government agency of endless proportions and to get bigger and bigger and bigger and to take and uh, make the uh, state bureaucracies much, much larger eventually. So this is a bad bill, bad idea, and I hope it doesn't pass. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Cheryl, would you please call the roll? I will. LD 174 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. No. Representative Joseph Underwood, no. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McCray. An enthusiastic yes. Representative David McCray, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. 10, yes. One ought not to pass, Representative. Right, correct. One ought not to pass and two absent. Okay, on LD 174, an act to implement the recommendations of the ending hunger by 2030 advisory group is ought to pass as amended. 10 in favor, one against, and two absent, it passes. And we will close the work session on LD 174. And we'll open up the work session on LD 493, an act to allow custom slaughterhouses to produce cuts of meat to be sold commercially in the state. And would you let in Senator Timberlake so he can be here while we kill his bill, I mean, while we work his bill? Yes. Would you like me to keep um, the DAFs person in? Sure. Okay. Just be nice. Good afternoon, Senator. All right, Karen. So um, last Thursday, you all received a briefing uh, from the department on, um, it was uh, their findings and recommendations for supporting meat slaughtering and processing in Maine. Um, so you had all requested uh, them to convene a working group over the interim by letter. And uh, so Director McGrady uh, reported back to the committee last Thursday. Um, so LD 493 is originally drafted would uh, authorize custom slaughterhouses to produce cuts of meat to be sold commercially in the state. Um, the, in in the, the PowerPoint and, and in the report itself, there were uh, five primary recommendations um, that, that came out of this report. I think uh, two of them, I, I think could, um, one is um, Uni University of Maine Cooperative Extension Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point uh, position. That could be uh, a recommendation where I would see legislation is necessary or at least, um, something to be included in the supplemental budget if that's what the committee wanted to do. And then another recommendation that I th thought um, 
may require legislation is supporting funding for a main specific feasibility study. Um, I think the department or the working group, um, the report uh, uh, talked about $100,000 to support main specific uh, feas feasibility study to be conducted by the University of Maine or other Maine academic institution. So those are the two recommendations that kind of jumped out as um, maybe needing some legislative action, but um, I'll just leave it at that for net. You heard you heard the report uh, last Thursday. You heard the recommendation. So um, whether or not you want to use Senator Timberlake's bill as a vehicle for any of those proposals is up to the committee. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions for Karen? Seeing none, Senator Timberlake, would you like to comment on the bill and all the report? You want me to lie? You want me to tell the truth? <laughs> be honest. I haven't, I, I haven't seen the report, Senator Dill, to be honest. So I, I, I can't comment on something I haven't seen. All right. Very good. Thank you. Director McBrady, any comments you would like to make? Uh, sure. Thank you, everyone. My name is Nancy McBrady. I'm the Bureau Director of the Bureau of Ag, Food and Rural Resources. Uh, I found that LD 493 was galvanizing for all of us. As you saw from the presentation last week, uh, we, we put our time to good use and thought that uh, there's some, some real uh, potential in the area of removing bottlenecks, and we're hopeful that there can be traction in some of those recommendations. We will be going forward with continuing our discussions with the Department of Corrections and Maine Community College around training uh, labor force, skilled workers, et cetera. Um, Senator Timberlake, Timberlake, happy to discuss the report at any time. I believe we, we did send a copy your way last week um, and happy to chat through it with you. Um, and Overall, with respect to the underlying LD 493, we do stand by our original testimony that was not supportive of that uh, legislation at that time. Okay. Um, so from your recommendations, there was what, uh, five, I think it was, and as Karen pointed out, a couple of them in her estimation needed uh, possible legislation. But from your angle, were the other recommendations something that you can handle through rulemaking or as you just move forward? Yes, Senator. I think that the, the two that need funding would be the two that uh, would, would be helpful to pursue via legislative uh, action. Um, we are committed to pursuing our effort with, um, as I mentioned, other state agencies and partners around exploring development of training programs. We will need time to formulate you know, any recommendations of policy that we could come back to you all next fall with. I, I don't believe we need a resolve to tell us to do that. We'll be doing it anyway, but if you wanted to, certainly feel free to add that to it. Um, and then I think the other things we were going to try and find funding ourselves to help uh, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension expand its livestock uh, assistance and training. So did that answer your question? Yeah, I think that leads us to two things that uh, Karen pointed out that probably does need some help. <clears throat> because I remember you saying that there was no funding or you didn't put funding in um, the supplemental budget from the department to fund the HACCP position and the other training as we went forward. Questions, Representative Landry. Uh, thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Director McBrady. So the compliance with the federal regulations is something that can be worked out. Initially in your first testimony, March 9th of 2021, you were not in favor of it or worried about that aspect. Yes, Representative Landry, we're very worried that this uh, bill as originally proposed would have basically uh, gone against current federal regulation uh, regarding inspected meat or rather uninspected meat entering commerce. And so if we pursued that, our existing main meat and poultry inspection program and our cooperative agreements with USDA um, would be put into doubt. So you feel that we can make it work? I do believe that our current process 
um, is the way we should continue with the emphasis on building capacity in the state of Maine to allow for existing and future processors to receive support across a number of ways to increase their capacity and their productivity. So would we still not allow custom slaughterhouses to retail product? That's correct. We would keep the status quo whereby inspected processors who are inspected on a daily basis, their, pro their products may be sold at retail, whereas custom products that are created must be labeled not for sale and are sold through um, the normal channel uh, under statute right now. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so if you could entertain me, I, I have a couple of three questions. So um, and I missed the work session last week. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to come up to speed here a little bit. Um, uh, so how does the department plan on uh, increasing the number of slaughterhouses? If they, you know, and, and, and the kill, you know, more availability for us to kill animals in the state of Maine and build the infrastructure. That's a great question. Um, the report goes through the um, numerous opportunities starting in 2021 and into 2022, both at the state and federal level that is injecting much needed, needed capital into meat processing. Um, there, there's a couple of ways on the state level that that has happened. First through CARES Act funding, almost a million dollars went to processors, meat processors in the state. And the uh, currently open grant application for the agriculture investment infrastructure investment program where $20 million will be disseminated throughout agriculture. Um, meat processors and slaughterhouses are open to applying for that. Uh, similarly, the USDA has committed about a billion dollars towards meat processing um, across the nation, which we at the department are giving lots of information on, on numerous occasions and on an ongoing basis to the processor community in the state of Maine to alert them to those opportunities. Some are grants, some are loans, really just making them aware that there's an unprecedented amount of federal dollars right now being aimed specifically at meat processing that they should really seriously consider. And then third, we did put forward um, a bill that was voted out of this committee that would amplify the ability of our existing ag marketing loan fund, we would reduce the interest rate from an uncompetitive 5% down to the, the prime rate um, on day of closing, uh, and also make some of the um, borrower contributions under the existing loan program more attractive uh, so that it's just not sitting there unused at the moment, but it's something that processors or any ag producers could hopefully apply for and utilize um, and we also did request in this legislative session under this supplemental budget, one more staffer so that we can keep up with demand, including for the at least three new slaughterhouses that will be coming under state inspection due to federal funding. Uh, there was a, a grant of $1.1 million that was awarded to seven folks here in the state of Maine, existing processors in the state. Um, so money's flowing in. It's not perfect, Senator Black. We, we, we can't help everybody, but there's we're capitalizing on what seems to be a very fruitful moment in time when there's finances being directed to meat and slaughter facilities in the state of Maine. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, uh, Nancy, I, I appreciate the movement that I have seen uh, with the loan process over the last couple of years and the extra federal money coming in. But this has been a long-term uh, problem for years. Um, and um, my concern, I guess, a little bit is, like uh, the bill that we had before us, the labeling bill, has kind of got lost in the weeds, something that would have really helped local farmers um, you know, grow and produce and, and prioritize local meat has been lost in the weeds, I believe, uh, in the department. So I'm concerned that um, even though you said that you don't think we need a resolve, instead of, you know, my feeling is that um, we need to hold the department's feet to the fire 
And uh, instead of uh, killing this bill uh, or ought not to pass or whatever, I think we need to have a resolve to have the the um, department give us uh, continue to work on this and come back to us with uh, something in in uh, January, even if it's uh, more or less just a progress report. But I think uh, there's a lot of stakeholders out there that would like to be involved in this that haven't been involved in it at, up to this point. Uh, just your thoughts on that. I certainly agree, Senator Black, that this is a very important area and sector of Maine agriculture and continued shepherding of conversations and ideas and activities around this, or we're committed to doing that. So if you would like a progress report, um, very happy to, to have that happen. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Uh, Nancy, uh, would you object to having a stakeholders group to, to work on this with you? No, not I'm at all. With, yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions, comments? What does the committee want to do about the two recommendations? Oops, okay, I'll go on with Rep Representative Pluker. I was gonna basically say this, think the same thing that you're saying, Senator Dill, is uh, try to include funding for those recommendations in this bill, um, seems like a good move. And then also adding the resolution asking for a stakeholder group with the progress report back makes sense to me as well. Karen, could you mention those two uh, points that needed funding I get once more? Sure, I, I did send you an email. I, I did type up essentially the recommendations from the report. I can screen share that with you. It's just a one pager of all the recommendations, but it's recommendations two and four. Um, I'll go ahead and screen share unless- All right, yeah, that's easy. It's, that way we can, it's easy to visualize and you're reading it to yeah. us. Yeah. Um, so recommendation number two is the University of Maine Cooperative Extension HACCP position. So it would allocate funding to the department to underwrite a new permanent position at uh, Cooperative Extension. Um, and it's approximately $105,000 annually. And then the other one um, <clears throat> would be a feasibility study. So it's $100,000 to support the feasibility study. And um, the only sort of requirement is that be conducted by a uh, main academic institution. And it kind of lays out um, what the study should be looking at. Uh, so those are the two. And then um, it sounds like uh, committee members also would like to sort of have a, an allocated section, if you will, that would direct um, the department to continue convening uh, stakeholders over the interim and to uh, provide another progress report in January of 23 on, um, on this topic. I, I would just ask a quick question of Director McBrady on the funding for the HACCP position of 105,000. That basically just covers the cost of the position. If it's a faculty position, it doesn't add any you know, thing else to it, but that's neither here nor there. But my question to you is why bring it through the department, add an extra step to it rather than directly going to the university system? Was there some reason for that? I mean, I'm just asking, I don't know. This was somewhat modeled on the BPC um, relationship whereby the BPC underwrites, as I understand it, um, some technical assistance uh, act activity by um, University of Maine Cooperative Extension around pesticide. Uh, and and it, the BPC um, being able to generate revenue through fees, et cetera, underwrites that. Um, so we just thought that that could be a very direct way of ensuring that the funding would go specifically to, to this HACCP work. Um, yep. We thought it would be less hoops, quite honestly. I was just curious. Senator Black. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree with Representative Pluker in his comments of, you know, the moving maybe forward with those two and, and having the resolve, as long as the resolve was inclusive of the other three points uh, that was, you know, uh, identified there. All right. 
Someone want to make that a motion? Ought to pass as amended. Representative Landry. Yes, I would move that uh, 493 move as amended. 493. 493, yeah. As amended and the amendment was as we just discussed, as adding, as well. adding funding for two and four, the other three are in there in unallocated <laughs> language. Karen, the yeah. Karen, is that you got? Seconded. Seconded, Seconded by Representative Underwood. Further discussion, Senator Black. No, I didn't take my hand down from before. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Any further discussion? Seeing none, please call the roll, Cheryl. LD 493 ought to pass as amended. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. 11 yes, two absent. On LD 493, an act to allow custom slaughterhouses to produce cuts of meat to be sold commercially in the state ought to pass as amended. 1102. It passes. I will close the work session on LD 493 and we'll open up the work session on LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system. Karen. And um, at, we had a work session on this and it was tabled, so it needs to be taken off the table. All right. Can I have a motion to take that off the table, please? Representative Hall and seconded by Representative Pluker. All in favor, just raise your hands, please. And it's off the table. Karen. So um, I guess how things stand. Uh, so this uh, Representative Rohowski, the um, sponsor of the concept bill, uh, did put forth a proposed amendment that would replace the concept. And um, so that was sent a, a few days prior to the public hearing and that's what the testimony was about. And then um, hopefully you did see uh, since that time, Senator Dill um, also put forth an amendment that made um, some changes to Representative Grahowski's uh, proposal. Um, I won't go through that now, but one thing I wanted to bring up, there was the question uh, raised at the, the last work session of whether this would uh, trigger um, Article 9, Section 23 of the main constitution. Um, and I've, I've forwarded the email chain um, between me and the assistant AG, Lauren Parker. But basically the question um, was posed whether uh, Representative Rahowski's amendment um, would trigger that section of the main constitution and section 23 of course is um, essentially public lands um, designated by legislation um, implementing this section may not be reduced or its use is substantially altered except on the vote of two thirds of all members elected to each house. So more directly the question is does uh, the proposed amendment uh, substantially alter the use of public lands and as a result require two thirds vote of the legislature. So um, uh, I think initially this question was posed to the director of the Bureau of Parks and Lands, uh, Andy Cutco, and um, the attorney general's office asked that the question come directly from the 
committee. And so I did uh, submit an email on behalf of the chairs and um, Assistant Attorney General uh, Lauren Parker responded that, um, <clears throat> I'll, just, I'll just read part of her email. Um, as I understand it, the proposed amendment would among other things increase to 8% from 6% the acreage of operable timberland on public lands that the director may designate as ecological reserves. I understand that the Bureau of Parks and Lands does not consider the proposed amendment to substantially alter the uses of public lands. I agree. Although the law court has not yet opined on the meaning of Article 9, Section 23 of the Maine Constitution, I do not think increasing the cap to 8% would substantially alter the uses of public lands. As a result, I think the legislature may enact the proposed amendment by a simple majority vote as opposed to a two thirds vote of all members elected to each house. So that was um, a key question at the last work session. So I'm, I'm happy to, Senator Dill, if you want to talk about your proposal, um, or if you want me to go through it, I'm happy to do that. You can go through it, Karen. There's just two um, quick changes in it. So if you want to bring those up. Sure. Um, and this was sent to you a few days ago. Um, Give me a minute here. I'll share my screen. Share. Okay. So um, it basically builds on Representative Brahowski's amendment. Um, everything is the same as what she had proposed initially. Of course, the focus has been on uh, that subsection five. So um, Senator Dill's amendment. Uh, proposes to change the, um, the limitation on total land acreage designated as an ecological reserve. Current law provides it's either 15% of the total land acreage under the jurisdiction of the Bureau or 100,000 acres, whichever is less. Um, and Senator Dill's amendment proposes to put a hard stop at just 115,000 acres would be the upper limit. And of course, going back to, to uh, Representative Brahowski's amendment, uh, she had no upper limit on that. And then uh, another thing that Senator Dill's amendment does is it <clears throat> kind of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, defines inoperable lands. The problem is that term isn't used in statute. So I, uh, I had to find a way to incorporate it because because I can't define a term that's not, it doesn't make sense to define a term that's not used in statute. So I think what Senator Dill was trying to do was inform what operable timberland means. So that's uh, what this does. It, it basically says operable timberland, this is current law, means land the Bureau considers viable for commercial timber harvest operations. And then his amendment says, and does not include inoperable lands, which are lands not suitable for timber production due to topography or hydraulic setting, hydrologic setting. Uh, inoperable lands include ledges, steep slopes, non-forested barrens, mountaintops, non-forested wetlands, and other not productive sites. And then um, <clears throat> the next uh, paragraph, and this is actually a suggestion that the Bureau of Parks and the Lands made in their testimony. And I believe Representative Brahowski said she would have considered this as a, a friendly amendment and Senator Dill included it in his proposal, um, just basically clarifying that the designation of land as an ecological reserve may not result in a decline in the sustainable harvest level on land under the jurisdiction of the Bureau to less than the average annual harvest for the preceding 10 years. And then it goes on to define uh, what har sustainable harvest level means. Uh, so that's the gist of Senator Dill's amendment. Thank you. Questions for Karen. Representative Underwood. I have one quick question. 
Where can I locate uh, Senator Dale's amendment real quickly, if I could? Um, I can send it to you again, if that would be easy. Email, does that work? Yes. Okay. Uh, there are other questions, comments. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to hear from the sponsor on um, this amendment. Sure. Representative Grahalski. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, members of the uh, ACF committee, for having me visit um, twice in one day. It's a pleasure. Um, I am Nicole Grahowski. I represent um, the city of Ellsworth and the town of Trenton in the main house. Um, I, I think while there are um, parts of the amendment that I, I'm not um, a huge fan of in terms of um, the policy implications of, of putting a strip cap um, where something like a percentage might make more sense um, and be a little more future-proof, I do, in, in talking with Senator Dill, recognize his um, reasons for uh, proposing that um, strict cap, if you will. And, um, you know, if it is uh, necessary to gain the support of committee members, I recognize that that is um, part of what we're here to do uh, is work together and make a compromise. So I would just say that much and I, I hope that it will earn the support of the committee. Um, and I do think it is accomplishing, we're still able to accomplish the, the overarching goal, which is to make sure we have space in our ecological reserve system for currently unconserved ecosystems to become a part of that system. And I, and I think this amendment does allow for that. And so I appreciate um, sticking to the main policy goal. And the other um, sort of definitions or context that's added, I think do make good sense. And I appreciate those clarifications in the amendment. Thank you. Senator Black. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if this uh, should be included in the amendment or not, but I would like to see a report back a yearly report back uh, on progress and you know how how they're doing on you know the status of the ecological reserve. Uh, Karen, do do we get an annual report from the Bureau of Public Lands or? You do. Um, March, I believe it's due March first of each year. There is a, what was kind of termed as the lands report, and certainly ecological reserves is a subset of that report back to the committee. So I, I think in that respect, it's already <coughs> covered by that reporting requirement, which is in law now. Does that do that for you, Senator Black? Yeah, as long as it, you know, as long as we find it and it doesn't, you know, uh, get lost in the weeds, you know, it's. Okay. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. I, I agree with Representative Grahowski's assessment of, of where we're at. And I believe that your amendment, Senator Dill's amendment is appropriate and I will be able to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Representative Dill, I will move that uh, that this be passed as amended as what was just presented as the amendment yep second. okay seconded by representative o'neill any further discussion seeing none please call the roll cheryl ld 736 ought to pass as amended senator james dill yes Senator James Dill, yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black, yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman, yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill, yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. 
Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McRae. Yes. Representative David McRae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. 11 yes, two absent. On LD 736, an act to enhance the ecological reserve system passes 11, zero, and two absent. And I will close the work session on LD 736. And we'll open the work session on LD 1929, an act to provide assistance to areas severely infested with brown tail moths. And I will turn to Karen again. Karen, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this bill in section one requires the Department of ACF to administer a program to assist a government entity or nonprofit organization uh, with the control of brown tail moths. And then section two of the bill uh, includes appropriations and allocations to provide funding for uh, three, three initiatives. Um, so under forest resource management, the first initiative uh, would provide funding for one entomologist, one position, and one senior entomology technician position. Um, the second initiative provides ongoing funding for administration of the program. And then under the Office of the Commissioner provides uh, funding to the Office of Information and Technology for their costs. So the total general fund cost is um, $342,908. So uh, we only received testimony in support of the bill. Um, and um, the only thing I wanna point out is, uh, and Rebecca Graham from Maine Municipal Association spoke to this in her testimony, is there is a current law in Title 22, uh, which is kind of public health related, that the director of the Bureau of Health may declare an infestation of brown tail moths is a public health nuisance. And uh, so the declaration can either be made on the director's own initiative or on petition to the director by municipal officers in a municipality affected by the infestation. So as Rebecca pointed out, this allows a municipality to expend more of its own funds to conduct um, aerial spray operations if that's what the community, community wants to do. So um, in terms of information requests, Representative O'Neill, I did ask um, the state entomologist at the Maine Forest Service, um, Allison Kenodi, and also I think she posed a question to Maine Municipal Association about wanting um, examples are kind of to spell out more what the costs have been to municipalities. So I will uh, leave it at that for now. Representative O'Neill, do you need to hear from uh, Allison Kenodi? Was there a question that you'd asked her or did we get the information or? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would appreciate hearing from um, Allison Kenodi or um, if someone from MMA is here, just to hear Rebecca some Graham, more. Yep. Yeah, we'll let, let them both in. Yep. And the question had to do with um, just the burden that municipalities are bearing right now. Good afternoon, Allison. I'm not sure if you heard the question, if you were somewhere in between, but. Uh, the representative was curious if you had any, we'll ask uh, Rebecca Graham the same thing about anything uh, with costs, either the department on um, what they're doing with brown tail moth, uh, as far as the municipalities are concerned. And the same question would go to Rebecca about costs to municipalities on brown tail moth. I think, is that your question pretty much, Representative O'Neill? Um, I missed part of that, but I was just hoping for a, a little bit of insight as to what burden municipalities are right. bearing now, so we could understand. Yep, okay. that's what I asked. Yep. Great. Good afternoon, Senator Dill and uh, Vice Chair O'Neill. 
um, thank you, and members of the committee, thank you for your time today in this work session. Um, I want to recognize Rebecca Graham's help in uh, gathering this information regarding municipal burden for brown tail moth. Uh, we worked together to um, get a survey out to municipalities and we had a fairly good response given the short timeline. We had um, 51 different municipalities respond and they came from not quite all corners of the state. Um, looking at Representative McRae, um, we did not get any respondents from Aroostook County. And then looking at O'Neill, nor did we get response from York County, nor Washington County. But aside from that, we did get responses from other corners of the state. And that response rate kind of reflects the area that we had brown tail moth known um, in notable numbers, although we do have detections in both Aroostook and Washington counties. So getting sort of to the details of the responses, um, we did ask um, towns what they were doing and they're doing things like providing information, both uh, printed information, information on websites, mailings and their town reports. Uh, some of them even using electronic signs um, on their roadways. And then uh, they're also providing some control in some cases either mechanical control or chemical control. And the control is being offered mostly on public properties and in some cases on private properties. And looking at the, uh, the cost, um, we had about 41% uh, of the respondents um, or 21 of the respondents had costs either not really identified, but they had had activities identified. So um, it was either, they either said they didn't spend anything, but they had activities. So there's cost and there's activity, um, or they they uh, had minimal costs. And that, so that was 21 of the respondents. Another seven of the respondents uh, had costs between a hundred and $5,000 identified. And then, um, Three had cost between ten and fifty thousand dollars identified, and four had cost between um, fifty and a hundred thousand identified. And looking at that that breakdown, um, I don't know if you're interested in the geographic spread of those or not. Sure. I would not. Oh, go sorry. ahead, Representative Neil. You you were the one who asked the information, so. Please, that would be helpful. And and just something else we noted too was that costs, or I have heard over the years is that costs are a barrier and that if one community is doing it here and it spreads, it comes back or something, you know, that those become issues too, so. Right, um, and I just point out just real quick, sort of in response to that comment that, that treatments don't stop the outbreak. So that's just something to be aware of, even if, you know, all the neighboring communities get together and treat, it doesn't necessarily stop the outbreak because there's other factors that are kind of driving it. Um, you're not gonna treat the entire outbreak, um, but it is helpful if they are coordinated. Uh, so looking at those higher levels of cost first, um, we had respondents in both Cumberland and Kennebec County in that 50 to $100,000 range. In the 10 to $50,000 range, we had respondents in Knox and Cumberland County, and then one where the town wasn't identified, so the county's unknown. In the one to $5,000 range in Hancock, Kennebec, Knox, and Sagadahawk counties. And then in the zero to $100 range, Cumberland, Franklin, Hancock, Kennebec, Knox, Oxford, Penobscot, Sagadahawk, Waldo, and unidentified. So pretty broad spread across the state as far as that's concerned. And then the other thing that I thought um, might be of interest is that there were some narrative responses sort of relevant to the bill language. So I don't know if that's something that you'd be interested in as well. I mean, it's not testimony, right? Because it was right. not provided as public testimony for the hearing. Um, what kind of things are you talking about, Allison? Uh, so we asked if there was anything else that they'd like us to know about the town and brown tail moth, their towns and brown tail moth. And so some of them spoke specifically to the provisions in the bill, um, the pr provision of funding for towns or 
provision of additional staff to the department. Okay. So I assume that means they were supporting it. Um, not all of them. Not all of them. Okay. So it was mixed. Yeah. All right. Rebecca, anything you want to add to uh, what Allison just has pointed out to us with uh, cost or impacts in the municipalities? I, I thank you, Senator, to like to say thank you to Allison too for for pulling this together and managing that um, that survey on our behalf. I, I did get some email responses back from that push out um, that were indicating that they thought the appropriation was really low um, given the, the lift that municipalities have. We do know, for instance, Waterville has allocated about $60,000 for just addressing it within the community. They felt the, the appropriation was, was rather low, but um, saw a lot of benefit in the coordinated effort and having a state level partner in terms of being able to direct that uh, and additional staff. There was some testimony, I believe, that got submitted today from one of the municipal officials who is also a former um, entomologist, I believe, that I may have some information for you that would be um, a benefit as well. Great. Any other questions anyone has? Representative Hall. Yes, thank you, Senator Dill. What was the fiscal note on this whole project? I wasn't able to find that. Uh, in 22-23, the physical, fiscal note is three hundred and almost $343,000. Okay, thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree that this is too small and, and, you know, we have a lot of competing priorities, but I do think it's a good start to have, um, to have a more coordinated approach and begin um, assisting municipalities in coordinating. So for that reason, I wanna move ahead with an ought to pass. So I have an ought to pass, seconded by Representative Schofield. Any further discussion? Uh, Senator Dill, I, I agree with Representative O'Neill. I, I think this is a uh, an amount of amount that uh, is not really enough, but it is a step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Karen. I just want to point out that it's it's um, there's no change to the language, but it likely will have a fiscal note. So it'll be a fiscal note only amendment because there's the appropriations and allocation section. So, right. but I'll bring that back to the committee for review. Okay, so it's as amended. All as right. Amended. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Cheryl, please call the roll. Yes. LD 1929 ought to pass with a fiscal note amendment. Uh, Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator James Dill. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Russell Black. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Senator Chloe Maxman. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Margaret O'Neill. Yes. Representative Randall Hall. Yes. Representative Randall Hall, yes. Representative Thomas Schofield. Yes. Representative Thomas Schofield, yes. Representative Lori Osher. Yes. Representative Lori Osher, yes. Representative Joseph Underwood. Yes. Representative Joseph Underwood, yes. Representative Scott Landry. Yes. Representative Scott Landry, yes. Representative Bill Pluker. Yes. Representative Bill Pluker, yes. Representative Jeffrey Gifford, absent. Representative David McCrae. Yes. Representative David McCrae, yes. Representative Susan Bernard, absent. 11 yes, two absent. On LD 1929, an act to provide assistance to areas severely infested with brown tail moths, it passes 11 zero and two absent. 
And I will close the work session on LD 1929 and ask Karen, anything else for us today? Yeah, um, I do have the fiscal note for LD 1805, uh, the Maine Milk Commission rules. Um, you did get a preliminary fiscal impact statement um, on the, or, uh, what we call the item one, uh, on the original bill, but as um, Michael Russo from OFPR, OFPR pointed out, it's kind of like a snapshot in time. So there have been adjustments made to the fiscal note. I did uh, send it, um, I did forward the fiscal note um, to you all uh, via email, but I can screen share it right now. But I just wanted to uh, have you take a look at it before I, uh, send this one off for processing because there are some different numbers. Okay. Um, let's see, let's share my screen. Um, so essentially, um, there is a difference. Um, I think the original preliminary fiscal impact statement had approximately a, a $10 million fiscal impact in state fiscal year uh, ending 23. And now it's uh, 8.75 million. And then the projections initially in the, the first uh, estimate that you got were approximately 8.8 .8 million uh, for fiscal years 24 and 25. And as you can see, um, that is a, a little lower at 6.9 um, for each year respectively. So um, I guess, it's mostly, the change is mostly due to the timing. Um, the preliminary fiscal uh, impact statement incorporated information in the rule submission packet uh, back in, you know, the, the rules were submitted by Maine Milk Commission back in August of 2021. So he tried, Michael said that he tried to merge that with adjustments made in the December uh, revenue forecasting uh, commission report. So this new revised fiscal note reflects year to date activity and higher prices. And it also assumes no uh, fiscal year 22 impact because of the special appropriations table process. So um, anyway, are there any questions on that? I had a question. Thank you. Uh, that, my, that last note you made about there will be no effect because of the appropriations table process. So we're assuming this. Um, Sorry. Uh, because it, it probably uh, by the time the uh, rules go into effect, it will have no net effect on the current fiscal year. <clears throat> okay. Gotcha now, because it won't happen until after July 1 or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none. Anything else, Karen? Um, no, uh, we meet on Tuesday. Only meeting, uh, so we're not meeting on, on Thursday of this week because you have session at 2 p.m. and then there's the state of the state address. So. We will, next time we meet is on the 15th. Uh, you're getting another briefing on um, the use of herbicides on school grounds, and then you have a public hearing on three bills. Okay. Very good. And I don't know if uh, you still want to, but chairs and leads, uh, if we, we want to meet real briefly to discuss the ACF calendar after, after yep. this. Okay. Sure. Representative Pluker. Do we know when the PFAS uh, briefing, the date of the PFAS briefing is? 17th. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. Anything else, Karen? Nope. Cheryl, anything from you? Nope. All right. Chairs and leads, we can stay on a little bit and go from there. Thank you all. Motion to adjourn. Yes.